pleasure and honor to be with you today with uh, an eminent speaker uh, today to talk about a very important topics, uh, uh, presbyopia management that is very important for all ophthalmologists, but not only for refractive and cataract surgeon. And we are facing all the days with uh, in our uh, uh, life practice. Uh, today we are having really an, uh, an eminent speaker and proud to have all of them with us. And I will start uh, uh, with uh, introducing them in, in alphabetical uh, manner. Uh, the first uh, speaker with us, uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed Asa, is a professor of ophthalmology in Shams uh, Cairo University, Egypt, Faco Refractive Consultant at Latania Eye Hospital, Cairo, Egypt. Uh, good evening, Dr. Ahmed. Um, you can say hello to so people to know you. So everyone, you, if there is you want to add anything, Dr. Ahmed, if I miss something, Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm glad to be here and uh, I'm expecting a very exciting webinar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for accepting our invitation. Also, uh, our dear friends and uh, uh, Dr. Arthur Cummings, and we are knowing him for now several times here with us. He's a well known figure in cornea and refractive surgeon. He's a consultant of pulmonologist uh, uh, in well, uh, Wellington Eye Clinic, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, good evening, Dr. Arthur Cummings. Hi, thank you very much. Hello to everyone. I'm looking very forward to a nice discussion this evening. Thank you. Uh, thanks for accepting our invitation also, Doctor. Uh, also, we, we have also Professor Dr. Mazen Sinjab. He's a FACO Refractive Consultant, Medicare Hospital and uh, Center, Dubai UAE. And he is uh, uh, with me. We will moderate this session. Uh, good evening, Dr. Mazen. Good evening, Dr. Mohammed. It's an honor to, uh, for me to be a uh, co-moderator with you. Uh, you are the boss. You are the moderator. I am the co. You are my boss. Um, um, also, we are having my friend also, Dr. Mohammed Imad Ariron. He's a, uh, a consultant ophthalmologist in Medicare Hospital, Sharjah, UAE. He's also well known as a refractive cornea and cataract surgeon. Dr. Imad, good evening. You are here, Dr. Imad. Dr. Mohammed, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, thank you, Dr. Imad. Uh, also, my dear friends and brothers, uh, we are sharing all the times our experience and talking to all the times. My dear friend, Dr. Osama Jalidi, is a consultant of pharmacologist in Morfield Eye Hospital, Dubai, UAE. Good evening, my brothers and friends, Dr. Osama, and have a nice trip and also vacation in Farpakkan. Mm. We cannot hear you, Osama. Your voice is a little bit... No, you are, you are not, we are not listening to, we are not hearing you. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to join you all for this nice, interesting evening, and I'm looking forward for the nice discussion. Thank you, Osama. Um, also, uh, we are uh, also honored to have uh, and one of the eminent speakers uh, worldwide also is Professor Dr. Rohit Chitti. He's a consultant, cornea and refractive surgery, vice chairman, uh, uh, in uh, Narayana, uh, Nidhalaya, Bangalore, clinical and uh, translation uh, scientist, Pro, uh, laboratory faculty department of ophthalmology, uh, Mystic University. Uh, good evening, Dr. Rahit. Hi. Okay, thank you. If there is anything, if I, I pronounce something because it's sometimes difficult, please correct me. It's, uh, it's not, it's okay. Um, also, it's, my pleasure also to introduce my uh, dear friends and brother, Dr. Safwan Al Bayati. Also, he's a consultant of pharmacologist, FACO refractive retina surgeon, founder and medical director of New Vision Eye Center, Dubai, UAE. Also, he's a well known figure and he is one of the uh, faculties that he supports me in preparing for this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Safwan. Good evening. You are mute, Dr. Safwan. Can you please unmute yourself so they can hear you? Yes, Dr. Mohammed. Great, uh, good evening. So great good thanks to, to you. And it's my, my honor to participate in, in, with, with my colleagues here in this important meeting and, and webinar meeting. Thank you, okay. Dr. Safa. Um, also, it's also my pleasure also to introduce Dr. Samuel Nibel. He's an MD <clears throat> and staff physician, department chair, anterior segment coronary refractive disorders in Eye Institute at Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi, UAE. Uh, Dr. Samuel, thank you and good evening. Yes, I'm really honored to be here and um, looking at the fellow colleagues, I'm expecting to learn quite a lot this evening. Thank you. 
uh, thanks for you also, Dr. Uh, and you are going to be the, our first presenters. So I would like to, to introduce you to give your uh, presentation. It is about what is the ideal drugs and we need for management of, uh, sorry. You are going to talk about the real, uh, uh, real uh, dry eye disease in, uh, I think in the Gulf and, and our area. Is that right, Dr. Uh, yes, should I share my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Is, um, is everyone hearing me okay before I begin? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Thank in, yeah. yeah, yeah. So thank, it's dry eye much. in the Gulf, sorry, yeah. Dry eye in the Gulf, regional in, uh, insight with global implications. Yes. Yeah, what I'm going to talk about is our observations here on dry eye and the realization I had that we, in fact, have a lot to teach the world. And uh, this will be about that. I'm, I'm going to make no mistakes that I'm the warm up show for tonight. And so um, I'm not going to be, I'm going to try to keep our minds relaxed and not show a lot of number slides and, and studies so everyone can just relax and enjoy uh, my presentation. And that'll leave. Uh, That'll leave our um, energy and our focus for the presbyopia discussion that follows. So we live in a beautiful country. The countryside is beautiful. Our cities are beautiful. And yet we all understand that, um, that there are challenges to where we live. The obvious ones are the very hot temperatures, the very high humidity. And when you put these two together, it makes for a very, very challenging index. Just take a moment to look at the map of the globe here and you'll see where we live is quite, quite un unusual compared to the rest of the world. You can mix this in with our ultraviolet uh, load that we have being uh, right at the equator. We have uh, many hours of internet use, a lot of professionals, a lot of people with iPads and, and and uh, phones and TVs. And we also spend um, many hours on, on the telephone. We have, believe it or not, in this list of over 100 countries, I'm only showing the top 50 here, we're actually number one, you know, staring at our phones and looking at our phones. It's not very uncommon for patients to come in with more than one phone even. So, um, it's really no surprise when we look at a very, just, just a very quick study uh, of our patients, when you can see the degree of staining where everything above the red line is abnormal. Um, and when we look at the tear breakup time where everything under this line is abnormal, that we really have a problem. And I'm, I'm moving so quick on purpose just to say the obvious. I'm not trying to, to take a long time with this, but we, we, uh, we are in an extremely difficult situation. The same with inflammatory <laughs> testing, a very high percentage, very high percent. And so what I'd like to do, I wanna skip all the, you know, science and numbers and studies. Let's, let's all stand on the shoulders of the fact that we know this and let you see some insights I've had about why this is true. Because if we understand why it's true, we can really start looking at it from from a way that's unique to our problem. And I, th I think too often we adopt our solutions to things that are already in the textbook and things that describe problems in other areas of the world. So I wanna build a model with you over the next five minutes on, on my thoughts. So I think of dry eye as having three main components, those coming from outdoor, those coming from indoor, and those coming from the makeup of our people, what's so about their genetics, about, about um, the many patients that we see here. So if we look at the uh, outdoor uh, stressors, we've already covered the high uh, heat index. We have a lot of dust and particles in the air. We've already seen the slide on high ultraviolet exposure. I'm not gonna argue the case very strongly that our close proximity to salt water plays um, a role, but I, I do think, I'm just gonna say that I do think it makes, it makes um, a difference. Being near, near so much salt water and seeing the corrosion that it does 
makes me wonder about the extra challenges that we have where we live. I've seen, for example, on this case for my bass guitar, the metal go in just one year from being new to looking like this. And I've had the same with bicycles. So I'm gonna pose this to the audience because I can't think of a way to study it further or, or more how to get a handle on it. But if anyone has ideas on this, please talk to me afterwards because it's just a suspicion at this point, um, but I'm, I'm trying to go further. When it comes to our constitutional problems, we know we have a lot of allergy here. We know we have a lot of diabetes. I believe we're the 13th country in the world uh, with the prevalence of diabetes. Refractive surgery is common, as is contact lens wear, especially those over-the-counter uh, tinted ones that cannot be a very good fit for the patient. And meibomian gland disease is very, very uh, common. We know that um, wh whether it's a constitutional problem, that is to say whether it's inherent in our patients or comes as a result of other things, I'm not quite sure. And so I'm not going to fight for this to be on this list, but I'm leaving it here uh, for now. Um, let's look at our indoor challenges. We have um, the most uh, ce cell phone use, computers, smartphones, and videos. We know this is a challenge for dry eye. We have a unique problem in this world with a relatively high percent of people sleeping with their eyes uh, open. It's called REAM sleep because it looks like the baby gazelles and how they sleep and, and parents think it's very cute when they look and see their child sleeping with their eyes a little bit open, but um, it can be a big problem. And I think I've even recognized that unique staining pattern that our patients come to, with, come to us with, this coarse, coarse band of staining that's really not in the textbook location for dry eyes. So I believe this is a regional problem that um, challenges us. Sometimes I ask a patient if they sleep with their eyes open and they say, yeah, my whole family does. This is just the, just the way we sleep. Um, I'm gonna go now and talk before about what I think is one of the most important things. I wanna go back to our regional uh, challenge. So there's a website that puts together all of these features, the, the humidity, the, the particulate matter, the high temperature, and they call it the misery index. And when you look at the globe from this point of view, the misery index, once again, it's really no surprise that we're up here on the high end of the scale. And if you look, there's not many other countries that share this, this rating. Um, and you can see there's other parts of the world that also have this rating up here. But there's something different about our region and these other areas of the world. And that is that we are fairly well to do with, with um, resources and we're able to actually control our environment. Whereas those other areas, I don't think do so as well. And so for example, while we live in this area that they call a high misery index, I'm willing to bet there's no one in the audience who really feels that way. None of us, none of us are in misery. We're all quite happy here. We're all very comfortable here. And the reason is because we can afford to do something about it. We can afford to have air conditioning uh, in many places and as strong as strong as we like. And so this is something that um, really makes us different is the fact that we not only have this combination of harsh environment, it's mixed with this ability to actually um, control it. So going back to this model, I think it's very important that we look at the high draft speeds that are used to um, control it and how long a time we spend in this sort of environment. So the consequences of high draft speeds are it, it increases tear evaporation, it cools the tear film, and this really makes the function of the lipid layer far less effective and far less efficient. The mybum layer is designed to work at a very specific temperature. Uh, these alterations lead to increased tear breakup time. And you can see here, I won't show, like I said, I'm not gonna show any studies or experiments, but I really like this figure because it shows that in this one experimental area where the blue line goes down and that shows a break in the lipid layer from 100 microns to zero, the evaporation rate of the liquid underneath 
goes way up. So you're basically looking at the dynamics of a tear breakup. That it cools the tear film is also shown with some pretty fancy uh, technology. Here you see a tear film that's breaking up and when you pair it with a thermal camera, something that we're now all familiar with at the um, you know, openings of our malls and stores and all, you can see that the tear breakup areas are definitely uh, cooler. So I wanna look at this from a, a really fun experiment I did with an air meter where I went around my house where I could actually feel how strong the draft was and I compared it with what should be accepted and what we consider is normal. So when we have the feet for, per minute in draft, we can start feeling it when it's around 100 and it becomes annoying when it's over 180. And so I bought this handheld draft meter um, and I know you're curious to see how it works. Some of you, after I've spoken about this before, have come up to me and asked to borrow it. And I wanna show you that being a real scientist, I of course didn't trust that it would work. So I calibrated it on my Segway uh, down the hall of my apartment building. And so here's uh, what I'm doing is I'm comparing the speed of the draft meter with the speed of the Segway. And what I did on purpose is to drive it through all the speeds and then make a chart that compares the uh, two so I can calibrate whether, whether it works or not. Now the numbers don't agree there because one is in miles per hour and one is in feet per second, but I know that I'm just satisfying some of your curiosity by showing you that. So what I did is I went around my rooms and I'm showing you here my bedroom and I divided it into one meter quadrants with some string. And I basically went around taking measurements and I played around with the vent fan location to see if I could have some say over, over the matter of what, what things are like. Now, when the vents are facing down, you can see the obvious that right in this area under the vent, it is uh, very, very windy. Here's the chair in my bedroom and that's at the annoying level. And if you go right underneath it, it's really, you know, just very, very fast. When the fan is in the neutral level, um, I got findings I wasn't expecting that I guess because the vent is up near the ceiling, the draft probably stayed over the level I was measuring and maybe swirled around to the exhaust and really created this measurable uh, draft here uh, over, over the bed. And so here's where, here's where I sleep and here's where my wife sleeps. And I was so excited. I was just like, you know, I felt like this great scientist. And I, I went over her to my wife and I showed her these results. And she said to me, uh, she said, you, you idiot, I've been telling you this for years. Why do you think I sleep with the cover over my over my head. And so I hope you're laughing a little bit because I, th I thought that was pretty funny. Now, when I, when I moved the uh, vent to the up position, it really took care of the situation. There was no, um, I couldn't measure less than 80. So I can't speak whether it was, you know, 70 or 60, but it wasn't at the feeling or annoying level. And so there's a message here, I think for us. Now I'm gonna skip very quickly because this is obvious. I did the same experiment with the car with the, with the van, the vents in different locations and um, everything's fine with them pointed up. Um, but when they're pointed right at you, it's obviously also not, not very good. Um, here you can see, it's just terrible. And as much as, we, as much as we say we know this, we all know when we get into our cars and it's real hot, we turn the fans right on us. But maybe for longer drives, we can try and, try and avoid this situation. So let's go back to our model. Um, I hope I've convinced you that draft speeds can be a problem and when they are, they really can affect the, the tear film. And let's, let's try to build this model together. So we have the end result of stressors that cause dry eye, uh, increased evaporate, evaporation, corneal neuropathy, limbal stem cell deficiency, goblet cell depletion, inflammation and trauma. And we can make the argument that if you look at the literature, the primary events of air pollution and ultraviolet are to uh, tax the limbal stem cells and reduce uh, goblet cells. Again, I'm keeping my opinion of salt water um, out of this for now. Um, allergy and contact lens will cause trauma by rubbing or the physical presence of the lens. We know that diabetes causes a corneal neuropathy sim similar to peripheral neuropathy. And we certainly know that severing the nerves in refractive surgery causes 
a largely transient, but, but certainly not completely fixable uh, corneal neuropathy. Um, meibomian gland disease, of course, it diminishes lipid layer instability, sorry, stability, and leads to increased evaporation. So this should be simple enough that, um, I know I'm not taking questions, but let's just keep moving. Um, high draft speed does two things. Just by virtue of the high draft speed, it increases tear evaporation, but certainly by the cooling effect, it's also going to uh, reduce stability of the lipid layer and indirectly increase tear evaporation. Uh, all the screen time use uh, decreases blink rate. We know that on average about 50% when you're really concentrating on something that will lead to increased exposure, which increases tear evaporation. But of course the increased exposure is also gonna help with this ocular surface cooling and impact the lipid layer instability. And then finally, um, not everyone has noc nocturnal log ophthalmos, but where, when you have it, there's no doubt that it increases your exposure. So this is the model that I have that I'd like to throw out to you. And it's led us to uh, think of several studies to try to, better get a, to get a better handle on it. I believe vitamin D deficiency should also be up here, perhaps as an indoor uh, risk factor because we stay out of the sun a lot. And um, I think that's a contributor to dry eye uh, as well. And so what I wanna do is say that whether or not we accept this model um, fully, we really have a lot to teach the world because when we look at our condition, increasing temperature, increasing ultraviolet, um, air pollution, we can really see that the world is heading a lot in our direction and that really, gives us something to teach the rest of the world. So here's a temperature map of global temperature over the years where red is hotter. And you can see over the last hundred years, we know the obvious that it's been getting hotter. It's also true that ultraviolet exposure is uh, increasing from the equator outward. So if you look at zero degrees latitude here, you can see this uh, purple curve that's showing the percent of ultraviolet increase. And where Europe is, it's up about five or 10% um, over the last, I don't know, 10 or 20 years. Also, this color map shows the percent of ultraviolet increase starting with roughly where we're at and moving outwards. And if you superimpose Europe on this graph, you can see that they're also going to be getting uh, more of that. Here's um, a weather model that shows the spread of weather like ours up north here from the 60s to 1990, where Europe basically has zero uh, number of tropical days, what they, find, what they define as tropical days. And if you go to the next set of years, it's spreading north. And by this model, it continues to spread uh, to the north. So there's no doubt, I think, or there's good evidence to believe that the kind of challenges that we face are coming to the rest of the world. Now, this is a map showing animals moving away from the bad weather and bad climate, but we certainly know that we're, uh, we're not able to do this. So we, we adopt by other means. And we've seen this uh, this summer um, as an adaptation to the weather. We also see that the number of people who have air conditioning in Europe is extremely low. If, if you can, it's hard to believe that there's only 6% of people have air conditioning and the number is expected to grow quite a bit over the next uh, bunch of years. So instead of this, we might start seeing something, something more like this. So we don't have a lot of time to go over ways to um, adapt to this model, but it's more of a call to, to our community to maybe start thinking of things like that and to start approaching dry eye from a, a considerations of, of this type of model. For example, in the old days, when someone had severe enough dry eyes, we used moisture uh, goggles. Here's a, a person with graft versus host disease who had extreme dryness. But you can send your patients to Amazon for very, very inexpensive, for about 50 dirham to get these cooking goggles that basically have a layer of foam so the bad, um, vapors from onions and all don't irritate the eyes, but they also serve as moisture chambers to keep the moisture in. And we can even think about 
um, designing more with this in mind. If I went back to a classic textbook in 1963, which was really considered a uh, genius for its time. And the author talks about putting up bar barriers to um, break up these airflows that, that um, can really cause trouble. I also spoke with a friend of mine, um, uh, Dr. Tariq in uh, Alain, who said when his children were looking for new homes, he actually had an app that simulated these sorts of currents and helped them pick a home and modify it so that these currents wouldn't be as bothersome during their sleep or where they, where they uh, spent the most time. And I'm sort of switching topics, but I want to show again that I really don't think our problem is dry eye in the sense of decreased aqueous production. So the, those same 50, 50 patients I showed you, um, when you look at Schirmer testing, above the uh, red is normal. And here you can see the majority of these patients produce ample amount of tears. So we really need to think of out of the way, out of the box approaches for dry eye. And I, I'm really hoping I can stimulate some discussion with you after tonight on developing this model further. One thing it tells us when you look at this is artificial tears aren't enough. Artificial tears help for a short while and, and they're not enough. I, I, I am gonna say a few, uh, show a few slides on lithidograst, which um, in the end, I'm gonna tell you some personal experience I had. So lithidograst is not just a lubricant, it's an anti-inflammatory. It works by blocking T-cell adhesion. And so as bad as these T-cells are, they're loaded with trouble and they're coming to attack uh, the, the, the lithidograst binds to the receptor instead of the ICAM sites, and they have no place to stick and therefore uh, ling linger around. That's the only science slide you're getting tonight. Does, does lithidograst work? It does work. It, it shows improvement over placebo in both um, subjective and objective findings. Um, I want to be honest with you when you look at this. Does it cure dry eye? Are these surveys zero compared to the placebo? No. Does it make a difference? Absolutely. And I'm gonna show you that when you think of the problem that dry eye is, this is a big deal. The fact that we can do something is actually a big deal. We, we, we can't really be very proud of what we've accomplished with dry eye so far. And so I have to tell you, I was first skeptical when I saw these studies. I was like, well, who cares? 10%, what's the big deal? What, you know, but, but it actually is. It actually is. These, these placebo patients were taking um, uh, artificial tears. And um, I want to show you something that, that makes me more excited about this drop than I started out being. But now I can tell you with great confidence that I'm, I'm a believer. So about three weeks ago, I started taking Zydra in just one eye because you can tell from that air meter measuring the drafts that I, I like to do, I, I like to do fun experiments. And I started putting it in one eye only. And after a couple of weeks, the treated eye started feeling better. Now, I didn't think I had dry eye. I don't go around complaining about dry eye and I wasn't even putting, um, artificial tears in the other eye. But I noticed that even though one eye felt like it always did, which was fine, the treated eye felt better. And so I actually had photos taken. This is just from last Thursday. This is my eye taken two days ago. And this is showing you the temporal conjunctiva of the right untreated eye and the left treated eye. And I think the picture is coming in very clear. To me, this is just typical textbook pooling, pooling of the fluorescein. Whereas here, it is very clearly uh, staining and trouble. Um, this was confirmed by one of our consultants, Dr. Greitz, who I asked to look at my eyes and told him, didn't tell him which eye was treated. Here's the uh, left, here's the uh, nasal conjunctiva of the untreated eye and the treated eye. And so while there's still some staining on the treated eye, um, it really made this big of a difference after just three weeks. So um, I just found this out yesterday, but it, it completely has me thinking that lifidograst is something that's really worth a try with our patients. And what I'm doing now is 
again, trying to stay a true scientist and I'm switching to this eye here with the Lifetograss and to stay consistent. Of course, I wanna take artificial tears, but I'm gonna keep consistent and not put artificial tears in the other eye and see what happens. So um, thank you very much. That's my, that's my presentation. And I'll give the screen back. Um, I'll give the screen back to you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Samuel. Uh, I was wondering actually what Dr. Samuel will talk today, because dry eye we are hearing every day. But you are as usual. Every time you are presenting in a different way, interesting way, attractive way. Really appreciate this presentation. I'm very happy because I I listen for something different, you know. And I think if there is any questions or any comment from dear colleagues here, because you are all uh, in this field and you are uh, having a lot of patients of dry eye and, and Dr. Samuel, he initiated a, a new concept also here. So if someone wants to ask or to comment, uh, anyone. Uh, Dr. Rimat, uh, because also I know you are uh, well known in dealing with a dry eye. So if you have any comment or about the uh, concept he mentions. I like it very much, actually. Well, uh, I do believe that uh, we all, as an ophthalmologist practicing in this part of the world, know that uh, dry eye is a common problem here. And I am happy uh, about the new development in the recent years, either in the matter of diagnostic tools, like uh, the tear lab, which is, gives the osmolarity, or uh, the new uh, inflammatory markers, which are now available in the market. And it's greatly improved our standard of practice and uh, evaluation for that uh, field. But also I am happy about the new medicine, which comes out like Zifigrast uh, uh, is a new player. It's a newcomer to the market. And I think he will be a game changer also because it's quite effective and efficient as per the studies. And we are waiting to be physically there in the UAE market so we can, uh, we can try it and test it for the patients. Okay, uh, uh, any other comments, Dr. Osama? If I have comments, Dr. Osama, please. Uh, yeah, it's a very nice talk, uh, Sam, as usual. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking also forward to, to use it. I haven't used it yet, so. Hopefully within the next few months, we're going to use it. So yeah. that will help us to manage better the dry eye. Thank you, Dr. Mazin, Dr. Safwan, Dr. Rohit. Anyone have, uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Rohit, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Samuel, very, very nice presentation. Um, I was happy that uh, you brought in the concept of uh, vitamin D because uh, that's been my area of work. And uh, when I started publishing on vitamin D, uh, 10 years back, uh, people felt that it was just an incidental find, not a, a direct link. And uh, we published close to 25, 26 publications. And the last one is in IOVS, where we look at uh, molecular, I work on uh, molecular data from the tears. And what we see is uh, the, the basically how the molecules, cytokines play important role. We take the tears and do our own analysis. What we feel is the person who has a vitamin D deficiency, his molecular inflammation is completely different from a person who has no deficiency. And uh, the reason is, it is mostly not driven only by the deficiency in your blood. The corneal epithelial cells has vitamin D receptors. Yeah. We call it as the VDR receptor. Mm -hmm. And it shuts down uh, when the deficiency is there. When you, you mentioned people not going out. When it shuts down, the inflammation is so high because there is some mechanism where the vitamin D receptors actually controls the inflammation. And we have noticed that even in COVID, uh, there was a link between people who are uh, having more symptoms of uh, inflammation. More severe. Uh, have severe have vitamin D, that's a vitamin D deficiency. That's right. Exactly. What we found is if you give them oral treatment, the vitamin D receptors in your cornea does not increase. And your medication of drops, what you keep giving, does not make the vitamin D receptors to increase. So we did some tests where we took the uh, conjunctive impression cytology 
from the cornea and we could uh, check for the vitamin D receptor. So one of the major factors today, especially the reason I brought it up and very nicely you brought it up in your talk is because of the climate change is also because of the new normal we are all in, we are more indoors and people going outdoors have shut down around 70 to 80 percent of the people at least in the place where I belong have completely not going out. So exposure to sunlight is completely dropped drastically. So vitamin D and its uh, components will have a huge role in, uh, in, uh, in the dry eye management. And the reason you mentioned about uh, your liftigrast, it works on a T cell mediated uh, uh, inflammation and the classic it blocks, uh, you mentioned it's, we studied that it's called ICAMP1. ICAMP1 is a molecule which blocks and unlike the restasis or cyclosporin, which looks at IL-2, interleukin-2, 6, and MMP-9. So ICAMP-1 also is very highly increased in a vitamin D deficient patient. So that means when you are indoors and you're more inflammation and you're vitamin D deficient, your ICAMP-1 is also one of the major factors to increase. So that is where I think uh, this drops will have an important role. So this is what I wanted to sum up based on uh, one of the part you mentioned, because so so help me build my much. model. Help help me build my model. I know that it's going to belong in the outdoor, sorry, the indoor risk factor for being <laughs> indoors. <laughs> but where should the That's arrow go? Okay. Should it go? Should it go right to the inflammation, or is there another uh, mechanism first? Uh, vitamin D is a very silent worker, both yeah. in health and both in unhealthy patients. In health, you don't realize it. Unfortunately, the, the, the net so, is not well. Yes. So what I'm, not, I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing. I'm not hearing the, your voice well. It's can cutting. you hear me now? Yeah, no, now okay, we are hearing. Okay. So okay. vitamin D is a very very silent worker, both in health and both in disease. When you're healthy, you nobody understands its worth and nobody cares for it. And when you're unhealthy, it's also plays an important role. In your case, according to me, the arrow which has to go in your model is the arrow of inflammation. Because vitamin D controls how your body actually controls your inflammation. See, let's take up one thing. Why has God or whoever has created us put so much of vitamin D receptors on the cornea? If something is there, it means it has to work. And vitamin D in your cornea is not, it does not require sunlight. It can secrete its own. That means it has a tremendous amount of response there, which is we have no idea why it is happening. And in the model of all of us, I'm strongly believer that that is one vitamin which we have to take care of when you're treating dry eye. And many, many cases, uh, we have seen that just treating it actually changes uh, the patient's uh, symptoms. And most important thing is, oral treatment does not get absorbed well, it's absorption issues, and the vitamin D receptors does not get kick-started. You need uh, injectables when it's very low. So your model, it fits very well in the, where you can put the arrow to the inflammation. Uh, Dr. Thank Muhammad, you, Dr. I, just, thank I just need one comment. Yes, Dr. Hamad, I know that the, the issues is delayed and uh, uh, Rahid, Rahid and Samuel, it was an, a great talk, but uh, I didn't comment because I don't need to, to uh, uh, extend the, the talk because it's very exciting. Now, what we are doing now, when any, so anyone coming to me with, the, with the, um, uh, uh, for example, PRK or trans-PRK, I'm doing uh, assessing the, the uh, vitamin D. I, I, I do agree fully with Dr. Rahit and somewhere related to um, the, the, the effect of the vitamin D to the inflammation. Why I'm doing it in those particularly trans-PRK because I found that those that they have um, corneal uh, haze after the trans-PRK, we are assessing the vitamin D level and around 70% of them, we found them that they have low vitamin D. Now I agree with you that oral is not like the injectable Exactly, but now in, in my practice, now I'm doing assessing the vitamin D for all patient trans-PRK and I'm stopping them if they have no 
if they have low and I'm increasing it in any way, whatever, then reassessing the, it, its end starting. So it's, as you said, it's a play, a big role in that uh, uh, issues, the, the inflammatory issues for in, in, in tear foam production. Thank you, Dr. Safan. Thank you very much. Uh, we are having many questions, but because we are late, actually, yeah. uh, we will keep the question till the end of our uh, discussion. So now we will start our uh, discussion. Our main topics today is the uh, management of uh, breast myopia. Dr. Mohammed, just one comment that we need we need to assess the net because the net now your your sound is cutting. It's not smooth. It's not current. It's not okay. continuous. So please, you John, are... let us John. Uh, uh, check the, the nets and the, the issues in a way that it will be more fluent. Okay, now everybody, if, if there is anything, just comment, please. Uh, you are hearing me very well now, it's okay, Safwan? We can yeah, hear I'm you, Dr. Muhammad, well. we, can, okay. we can hear you, but actually okay. there is an echo. When you, when you talk, there is an echo. Me or everyone? No, no, only for you. Only you. Oh, because maybe my room is very big, so I don't know. Yeah. What <laughs> there is, there is no, no solution for the time being. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry for that. Uh, I can open the AC, maybe it will decrease the echo a little bit. Anyway, so our topic today, you know, is very interesting and uh, we are going to talk about presbyopia management. Uh, and the, the big question is what are the different types of management of presbyopia? And I will leave the answer for Dr. Mazin to give these introductions. Please, Dr. Mazin. Okay, uh, Bismillah. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, now, I'm going to uh, mention just a quick uh, mentioning of the types of the presbyopia management. Uh, actually, we have 10 types of presbyopia management or treatments. Um, let's say we have glasses, contact lenses, and then we have the lens based. The lens based has two, uh, sorry, the laser based. The laser based has two types. The first type is the multifocal cornea, and the second type is the um, the type that depends on changing the asphericity of the cornea the, uh, and spherical aberration. Then we have the lens-based uh, uh, presbyopia treatment. The lens-based starts from the very simple from the uh, monofocal IOL with the mini and mi um, uh, monovision. Uh, then we have the premium lenses such as the multifocals, the trifocals, and the extended depth of focal lenses. Then there are corneal inlays. The corneal inlays are of two types, the refractive corneal inlay and the small aperture corneal inlay. So it is not only one type. There are two types of corneal inlays. Actually, the decision uh, depends on 10 factors. So we have 10 types and we have 10 factors. Um, we have to Thank consider you, Victor, patients. Uh, Dr. Mazin, uh, if we can keep the decision, so it will be part of the discussions. Yeah. Uh, if you allow me, uh, maybe when we are going to talk about each one, then we have to say why we are selecting this one. What is the, the reason for that? Is that what you are going to mention? It is, it is just an overview, an overview, okay. just to give an okay. idea. Okay. Um, because all of these factors affect all types of, of uh, okay. press okay. management. Go ahead, please. Yes. So, yeah, uh, patients age, patients demand, uh, patients type of personality, um, if there is a cataract or a clear lens, crystalline lens, whether the, the lens is in the cataract stage or maybe it is just a clear. What about the refractive error of the patient? Does he have myopia, hypermetropia with or without astigmatism or the patient is emetropic? Then tolerance test and other tests that, that we can uh, expect the uh, tolerance of the patient of special types, whether there is ocular morbidi morbidity, uh, for example, the dry eye, glaucoma, retinal diseases, and the systemic comorbidity, such as diabetes, collagen diseases, blood pressure, um, or other uh, uh, comorbidities. And finally, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, previous corneal laser vision correction. Maybe the patient had previous corneal laser vision correction and he is asking for presbyopia treatment now. And finally, we have the corneal regularity. Uh, and everybody is hearing Dr. Mazin? Yes. Yes, everybody. So yeah, so finally then the corneal regularity and the high order aberrations. 
Of course, everybody is looking for a solution which is safe, efficient for all distances and reversible. And by this, I can open the discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mazin. Um, so if you allow me, uh, just I will summarize for dear participants and all of you. Uh, let us say, uh, I will not mention as a 10, I was preparing that to be the main things because the other one is subdivision, if you allow me, Dr. Mazin. So we are having four lines of treatment, either the eyeglasses and contact lenses. This is one. Second line of management is laser-based, whatever the, the type. And then the third line of management is lens-based and the fourth line of management is camera inlay. So um, uh, everybody is agree about this one uh, or anyone no. have to add or to comment? Yeah, for the inlay, not only camera. Camera is a small aperture, but there are uh, the other type of inlays, which is the refractive inlay. Yeah, okay. A lenticule that is implanted within the cornea in order to, to do a job. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now we will go to the questions is, uh, and we'll start about the eyeglasses and contact lenses. I will ask this one, can you, um, Mr. John, uh, show this one? We'll take this uh, like uh, voting and we'll ask, uh, eyeglasses first line, is it still the first line of management for presbyopia, yes or no? So can we have uh, this question, please? And everybody can answer, please. Uh, I need to ask my dear participant to answer this question, even the speakers, if you want to share your uh, also with us, this one also, it will be a good. Then submit, please, everyone. Uh, let us wait for about uh, 10 seconds, then we can get the, the result. Okay. Uh, John, if you can, please, uh, everybody finish, please, uh, from our part uh, here, here, at least the, our speakers, they submit. So let us see the result, John. Yes, so we are having about 96% uh, 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 of the uh, here voting people, they are saying is yes, and uh, no, it is only in 4%. So let us see the opinion of our leaders here of uh, managing of. So Dr. Arthur, if you want to, I will start with you and give us your opinion about this. How far you are still working with uh, contact lenses and glasses. Yeah, I know. I think those numbers are right. Unfortunately, you know, I think there's something like 2.2 billion people on earth currently who are presbyopic. Yeah. And if you look at the number of procedures we do globally as ophthalmologists to correct presbyopia, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean. Yeah. And it's, it's quite a pity because the benefits of having presbyopia corrected in your eye, as opposed to with glasses is a lot more than just cosmetic. It's, it's functional. You know, I don't know how many of you are aware, most of you are, I'm sure, but if you, wear, if you wear very focal glasses, you increase your risk of falling and either getting a head injury or breaking a hip or breaking a knee, those three things, by 11%. So can you imagine if you just, every cataract patient you treated, or every presbyopia you treated, you got them seeing well without the need for wearing around in very focals, you've addressed that problem, just that one problem. So... Yeah, I, I think those numbers are completely right. Is for the moment, people still go to glasses for presbyopia correction. Hopefully, it's going to change now with, with masks because people don't like masks and glasses at the same time. Yes. Okay, what do you think the okay. reason behind that, the number of this percentage? I will ask this for Dr. Ahmed Assa. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, why do you think the number <clears throat> of the patients, they are still looking for the glass and contact lenses rather to go to another? another methods of management? Well, I still believe that uh, most of the patients are happy with their uh, reading glasses. Uh, let's say near glasses, because sometimes the reading glasses is, is not the correct term to describe the, the, this kind of spectacles. These spectacles are, should be used now, not only for reading, but just for TVs, for the computer screens and tablets and cell phones and any near work within the 40 centimeters from the patient's eye or the, from the subject's eye, let's say, because they are not all patients, they are just normal subjects. 
So I do believe that the number is pretty high uh, uh, with the spectacles because we had some issues in the past two decades with the other types for management of presbyopia. Uh, the modalities like the multifocal lens, we had the bifocal lens, we had the nighttime halos and dysphotopsias and the patients were not happy with this type of lenses. Uh, maybe some, some kind of inlays, uh, uh, cornea inlays has been uh, uh, withdrawn from the market because of uh, 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 suboptimal uh, uh, visual outcomes or some complications or uh, a corneal haze, for example. So we had some issues. Still, we are in the beginning of the road for correction of presbyopia. Don't forget the accommodative uh, lenses, uh, intraocular lenses already. We had some of these lenses in the past two decades, and now they are not, they are vanished in the beginning time. So still the main uh, line of treatment uh, so far is the spectacles and contact lenses, but I very, I'm very optimistic uh, down the road for the next 10 years that uh, this might be changed a little bit. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, here, Dr. Uh, Safwan. Uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Safwan? Uh, I mean, type of I mean glasses is most common to people: bifocal or the multi. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the other ones uh, they are using. Which one you are facing? Yes, Dr. Safwan. Dr. Mohammed, the, the issues is that I, I think that I, uh, I agree with, the, with both my colleague, Dr. Arthur and Dr. Ahmed, that our understanding for, for the current treatment is not reaching the, the satisfaction uh, uh, level of the patient. So from all our types of the, whether it's laser base or, or lens base or, or the use of uh, lenticular. Dr. Safan, I'm asking about only glasses, lens and contact lenses. I want about your comment about- That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, please, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, Muhammad, if you don't mind. Uh, so, so here, uh, from that point, uh, uh, we 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 have to use the the glasses. Otherwise, we 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 don't need, as Dr. Arthur said, uh, the glasses create a lot of trouble for the patient. But your question is that whether we are using bifocal or trifocal. Unfortunately, that the the progressive lens that we are prescribed for almost all our patients, most of our patients, because they are working patients that they are need for intermediate and the near and the distance, uh, uh, the, the opticians and the doctor, they are not uh, teaching those patients in a well, in a well uh, uh, or a good standard in a way that they will uh, understand what's the progressiveness of this lens. So they need to tilt their head for uh, down for to, to see the distance and up to see the near. Uh, uh, um, uh, meanwhile, they are using them all in, in the intermediate uh, vision. My, my, my concern is that I'm teaching the patient uh, well for the use of the progressive. Otherwise, if those patients that they are not using the computer, I prefer to, use, to give them bifocal. Thank you, Dr. Sopa. Uh, you know, just uh, for sake of the time, we want only uh, as much as we can for everyone this one, this comment, uh, so that we can benefit from the time. Uh, my question now about uh, the laser-based management of presbyopia. Uh, I want Dr. Uh, uh, Osama, to give a concept. What is the concept behind the laser-based management of presbyopia? Uh, so basically it's a uh, laser-based management. Uh, it can be divided in two really, either the monovision, which I think is the most common way to, to help presbyopia, but there's a limitation. So- What do you mean by monovision, Dr. Osama? Just you, to, make, you make one eye short-sighted. Everyone to know what you're talking about. Yeah. So basically the dominant eye, we make it for distant and non-dominant eye, we make it slightly short-sighted between okay. like minus 125, minus one and a half. Okay. And that can give you a near vision when there's age of 50, but uh, when the patient is age of 60, then he will be have intermediate vision. So it's, it'll give you a bit of freedom of a glass, but doesn't eliminate the glasses. I think that's the easiest option as laser-based treatment. We'll talk, Osama, we'll talk about limitation at this point, but I want only the, only the concept. The, second the other one, one is the other option, the other, other modality is multifocality. And there's different multifocality option depends on the different laser platform where you can do uh, multifocality or the other option also what you call extend depth of uh, field. And that's the third option looking in the cornea in the laser platform. Uh, thank you, Sama. Before I continue in this one, just I will ask you all here, uh, panelists, who is with, who would like to work on a, a laser base and who wants to work, uh, most commonly want to work on a lens base? I mean, if you will ask the two of one, you are working with... No, with well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing oh, oh, both, what? depending both. on the okay. patient's so condition. Both. 
both. So both. Okay. okay, Dr. Mazin? Yeah, Dr. both. Both, both yes. Dr. Ahmed? Both. Both. So Dr. Arthur is giving the answer in very good way. And then it passed. Okay. So Dr. Yeah, okay. Dr. Rahid? Both. Dr. Ahmed? Uh, Actually, it's about the lens. Why? What happens to you guys? It depends on the patient, but I think uh, all using both. Uh, Dr. Ahmed also both? Or you like? Okay. But if I ask who wants laser base more, I mean, who prefer this? And you can work both, but you like or more of your patient is laser based. Who, who is willing or he is prefer to go for a laser more than others? No, no, that's no, the no, age factor. Age factor is very crucial here. Age, fa age factor is very, very crucial here. I think the most okay. important factor here is the age. Okay, no, let's, no, go to, right. let's, go to the, let's go to the question. What is the eligibility for those laser, laser based management? Age factor and the time, the improvement in the. Uh, your voice is, I don't know. Okay, eligibility. Who is, uh, if I want to ask Dr. Samuel, uh, if you are treating a patient with a laser, what is the patient that you think uh, they are? No voice. To? You can hear uh, me? Hello? The, we can yeah. hear you, Dr. Hamad. We can hear you. Okay. So, I think the, the, your internet is not, it's not good, so that's why the, the, the voice is coming in, in, in a non fluent way. No, Dr. Safar, maybe you are the one not hearing because the other they are hearing me. This is the reason. Uh, okay, so eligibility, can you ask Dr. Samuel about the eligibility of the patient for who is the patient they are eligible to go for a laser-based management? Uh, I, I agree with that. I think we all feel strongly that it's a topic that uh, really has a lot to do with the patient age, the the state of their lens, and uh, what their what their what their needs are. But for me, the big determinants are the nature of any refractive error that's there. If they're hyperopic, for example, I'll really that'll push me one full step over to lens-based uh, surgery, knowing the inaccuracy of the laser and um, you know, and, and how much happier they're going to be if that's uh, corrected with lenses as well. The magnitude of the error also is a, a big deal. If they're a high myope and they're younger, I start worrying about uh, the formed vitreous and, and retinal issues. So that'll push me also in another direction. And then when I'm on the fence, um, I can't speak highly enough about um, maybe simulating what you're trying to do uh, to the patient, either with a contact lens trial of monovision or maybe um, seeing if they wore multifocal contact lenses before that, you know, because you should really try not to change whatever strategy they, they came to you with. So all of this is really important. And so, I think managing managing expectations is, uh, I mean, okay. this, this, this is the, obvious, the, but it's, it's Yeah, great. I want to summarize this point. I want to summarize this point. Can, we, uh, can I hear this from Dr. Nazim? If you can give it in a point so they can, yeah. our participants say, if they are having, I know there is so many things it cannot be summarized, but I know you are well known of the people that are moving systematically and educational. So I want to hear this from you. The okay. eligibility for the laser base. Uh, okay, for the laser base depends uh, on, as I said, on 10 points. But however, we okay. have to, very important to check the tolerance of the patient uh, and a simulation, as, uh, as Dr. Sam said, simulation of the patient vision. And this is for two points. Uh, uh, maybe when the patient experiences what the vision will be after, maybe he will, he will decide not to go for that. And uh, the other thing is, uh, in some types, there will be differences between both eyes in terms of the refractive error and the corneal asphericity. So we have to test uh, the, uh, how much difference the patient can tolerate. It is not uh, a, a cutoff um, uh, value to say that the difference should be 1.5 in order to get all distances. Sometimes some patients may not tolerate even 0.5 diopters difference between both uh, eyes. In addition, it is not necessarily that the dominant eye will be for distance while the, uh, the non-dominant eye will be for near. Some patients, they, they use the opposite. The non-dominant, they are more comfortable with having the dominant eye for near. 
they are rare, but they are there. So actually there are special tests to go for, and of course, special considerations for the mainly, mainly to summarize, age, patient's demands, and the refractive error or the refractive status of the, of the eye. And of course, the uh, status of the lens. Okay, if we ask Dr. Uh, Ahmad, uh, what is the age, yani you prefer, or you will think about laser base uh, rather to go for the lens base uh, if you want to, if we want to talk about the age, what is the age is suitable or pushing you to go for a laser base rather than lens base? Uh, is there any, for the there question, any Muhammad, suggestion? if you allow me just to, uh, uh, to clarify one concept, accommodation is a dynamic feature. When we try to replace it by aesthetic situation, whether it is lens-based or corneal-based, the brain will still confuse. The right solution, in my view, is moving this dynamic feature from the eye to the brain. And in order to do that, we should understand how the brain works. We are now developing our understanding about summation, suppression, adding, uh, and the special filters in the brain for the spherical operation. And because we are not good enough till now in understanding how the brain processing the image we are providing, that's why we are still evolving. The, Art yeah. of treating presbyopia is still evolving. If we Even though went Mr. back, I, I if we know, went back to the age, to your yes, question. Please. This is the question. Uh, yeah, the, I, I do believe that a uh, couple of multifactors are governing the age. But usually, the people who are start to demand it in the mid 40s, and uh, the majority of these people theoretically should have a clear optical media. That's why in this. Uh, age group, I do believe laser is the way to start with. But okay. when we go to the 50s or maybe 60s, we can expect that. No, Dr. Uh, Ahmad, it's okay. Here. I just, yeah, I need only a, a, an answer so that we can move systemically. So please, okay. yeah, I know uh, uh, there is a lot if we want to talk about presbyopia, but we want to make as simple as possible to our participants so we don't want to go to any complications. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, Dr. Rahid, he's in the past. So we need only a very short, so that we can cover all the material, please. Yeah, go, go ahead, Dr. Apart, apart from uh, all that has been discussed, uh, what I would uh, look for, which is very important, uh, Dr. Mohammed mentioned about clear optical media. But what happens is uh, when you are uh, between 40 and 50, clinically, you don't see anything clear. Everything looks clear, but the lens will have a lot of aberrations with it. Uh, machines like eye trace will call it as a DLI, a dysfunctional lens index. It's very important, especially if you're doing a laser on the cornea, because if your lens has already started showing a change, there's a chance, there's a chance that you'll have a problem. And second important thing which we need to consider is I always ask a question, were you comfortable with your, uh, with your progressive glasses? And many times they will say that we were not comfortable with the progressive glasses. And that's why I've come for a laser. That is a very, very important red flag to me. The reason is when you put these patients to a detailed binocular uh, fusional uh, testing, most of them have con convergence uh, issues. They don't fuse. And that's one of the reasons why the patients don't fuse well. They are, uh, the fusional vergence is extremely poor. And that's one of the reasons these people are not happy with your progressive glasses. If you do a laser correction on them, they don't fuse at all. And they will always complain of glare. So these are my two most important points. One, if you're doing high volume presbyopia surgery, please look for not just the clinical aspect of your lens, look for aberration of your lenses. Higher aberrations, higher trifoil is one of the major issues which will cause a lot of problem. And second is all my patients of presbyopia, I evaluate them for basic binocular single vision testing, which includes convergence, accommodation, and fusional virgins. And if I find that they're poor, we need to give them exercise before and after surgery. That's what I need to, this is the, this is the point I do in my practice. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rahit. Uh, 
uh, again, please, we are having still a lot of things to discuss. There is a scenario I will mention to you, so we don't want to go and uh, to finish everything in one just slide. So I need only in a very short advantage and disadvantage of laser beams. Just in a point, uh, who can uh, give this one? Uh, if I ask Dr. Ahmad or Dr. Arthur, any one of you, please, advantage or disadvantage of laser beams. Just in a point, yeah, one, two, three, four, that's it. Just two points that uh, the advantage, to my humble opinion, the, for the laser based, uh, that is a, still an extraocular procedure. It's less invasive compared to the intraocular uh, uh, procedure to correct breast myopia. This is one advantage for the laser based. But I do believe that it does not provide the full range of uh, near vision and intermediate vision as the lens based procedure. So we have win win situation. We have to choose according to the lifestyle of the patient and according to the age and the clarity of the lens, mm -hmm. as mentioned before. Okay. Thank can, you, can Dr. Just, Ahmad. Hamad, can, yeah. we just, can we just clarify for maybe the participants, but also for me, when you're referring to laser based, are we talking monovision and? specialized profiles or manipulation of higher orders or just one of these categories? Usually it's, uh, thank you very much for this question because I need to clarify this. Usually it's a sort of mini monovision uh, and uh, aspheric, uh, uh, and use some uh, asphericity of the non-dominant eye, making it hyperprolate cornea, so induce more depth of focus. So it's a mini monovision with aspheric profile in the non-dominant eye. Mm. Thanks. So the last point here in the laser base management is what is the limitations? Dr. Uh, Amazin, please, if you can uh, uh, give us what is the limitation for the laser base management, whatever it is. I mean, either the first one or the first option or the monovision or other ones. Well, it depends on the uh, on the type for the uh, mini vision, mini and mono, uh, however. So it depends on how much the difference the patient can tolerate. So it depends on the tolerance. Sometimes the tolerance is just like 0 0.75 or 0 0.5. So for sure, it will not cover all distances. Now for the um, multifocal laser uh, based, the limitation is the multifocality, uh, which is uh, the, the main disadvantage is irreversibility. And for the, um, uh, uh, let's uh, say the- For Mazen, the, the yes. multifocality is reversible by laser. Yeah, I know that there are platforms for, for uh, but uh, based on studies, uh, let's say it is not 100% reversible. Yeah, it is only a spherical aberration, so we are reversible. I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm, doing not, reversible. I'm not talking about the spherical aberration. I'm talking about the multifocal. Yeah, there multifocality is, multifocal. is a spherical aberration. That's the idea that you have it. It's a, it's a spherical aberration. It's, it's, a, it's a multifocality in a spherical aberration. It's a negative spherical aberration. I don't know. Are you I, talking, I think that, uh, are, yeah. are you talking uh, about uh, Q guided treatment or no. the other Q type guided of is a, is a spherical is a Q Q changes. I'm talking about. Okay, let us take uh, another opinion. So, in between Pro, Dr. Uh, Mazen and Dr. Safwan, uh, Dr. Arthurs, if you can comment about the difference, what they are talking about. Dr. Because Safwan. multifocal is a multifocal. It is not uh, not uh, just as It's a multifocal, right? But well, that's what I'm saying. It's a multifocal. And that multifocality is a negative spherical abrasion in the center. I think that maybe you, we can okay. ask Dr. Arthur, he can okay. explain more. But this is the this is the issue. This is the principle of the multifocal. Okay, let us, let us, yeah, Dr. Sopan, we are having a difference between you and Philip has another opinion. Yes, Dr. Arthur, if you can comment about this point. I think this is probably not a forum to go into detail of that because it's quite complex. I think the key thing for all of us and all our patients is whenever you discuss praised by opia, we st I start off by saying, look, this is a compromise. And it's my job along with you to try and find your best compromise. And so people say, what do you mean? And they say, well, if you have both eyes for distance, you can't read. And then I'd say to them for monovision or blended vision, I'd say, you know, if you had three eyes, I could solve the problem for you. We'd have one eye for distance, one eye for the computer, one eye for near. And then people very quickly understand, ah, okay, I get that. So if we do some kind of blended vision, I'm going to be missing one of them. So, and then you've got to do the same thing for, for lenses. And when they start understanding that you're splitting light, then people understand. And I think our job is to simply find the best compromise for that person's solution. That's it. They, they're all compromises. There's not one solution that's going to work except zero and minus one for the 45-year-old. That'll give them everything. 
but not for long. So yeah. I think for the moment, everything we do is a compromise and it's our job to figure out the best compromise. So you asked a good question, Dr. Almari, what's the, uh, what's the, the biggest downside to laser? And that would probably be that it's, it's a temporary solution. It's, a, it's an interface solution, but it might be the best thing for the moment. So I think if, if you see mini monovision or blended vision as an interim process, and once the person gets to 55, 60, 65, um, they have more aberrations in the lens then, and then you can start looking at, at IRLs. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a complex decision. That's okay. right. Anyway, the, as, the, as, the we mentioned, as we mentioned, as we mentioned, as one one minute, one minute. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. If, if you need that, that's all. No, no, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, please. That's all. Give that's your all. comment, please, fast. See, the, the, I, is, I know there is a debate. This is an important between. point. If you will skip it, because these these points it's an, an important. When we are talking about, for example, monovision uh, and uh, 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 induce and and as a negative spherical abrasion in the center, and then combine them both, and we have a, a, a technology that can combine them both, that can create a micro monovision and a, um, um, a spherical abrasion, that it's changeable, means that uh, in a dominant eye, I have an add of plus one, and in a non-dominant eye, I have a plus two. The, this is the issue that I can offer it to the patient if he can withstand it, and I can test it on a, 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 a multifocal contact lens, then if that patient that happy with it, then that patient will be a candidate for it. Ageless means that I can offer it for a patient with 41 up to the 50 if he can withstand a plus two in a non-dominant eye, a plus one in a dominant eye, and a micro monovision in a way that, for example, minus 0.75 and, and minus 0.25. If that patient accepted, then it will solve all the problem and definitely conditioning that our machine can afford us with this technology. Now, if our machine afford us only with a plus 1.5 and it's fixed for both eyes and with a micro, the 100% we will, we will not succeed. So from this point of view, we can discuss it. Yes, so it is a technology base and in the, on this base. Yeah, that's why, Dr. Sofan, I don't want to go through because of the different uh, uh, machine capabilities and this one. So we want only the concept, the normal that we know about it. So we don't want to go in deep about the capability of different uh, type of machines. Uh, if you allow me, please. Um, so let us go now out of the laser phase and go to the uh, another solution that we are using is the lens phase management. And I want uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I don't know, Dr. Osama, because I asked him before also about the concept. Let us ask now, Dr. Ahmed, please, if you can give us the, 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 the concept about the lens base and the eligibility, both of them in one. And in a few points, please. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I think uh, now we have uh, exciting technology for uh, lens-based uh, treatments for the presbyopia. Now we have a new trifocal lenses, we have new versions of the extended depth of focus. So it's an uh, improvement uh, compared to the previous bifocal, let's say bifocal lens that used to implant in our patients. We have new optics uh, with less dysphotopsias, better uh, functionality at all distances starting from the 40, 60, and 80, and uh, to infinity. So I do believe that uh, our patients are will be quite happy with these type of lenses once they are eligible for these lenses. And of course, we have a multi variety or varieties of these lenses uh, to choose among the uh, quality or the style, life or style of the, our patients or subjects. Uh, who is the eligible for this, uh, Dr. Ahmed? Uh, of course, the first uh, thing that uh, the lens should not, at least, should not be clear or at least some sort of aberrations in these lenses uh, uh, as uh, documented by ray tracing or some sort of aberrometer. Uh, so this is the, the most important factor that you might uh, consider this type of surgery. Of course, other, other uh, um, uh, uh, points to be discussed is the cornea spherity and the uh, the the uh, this patient that cannot work on the cornea level, or these patients are demanding uh, extended depth of focus, uh, starting from 40 centimeters, for example, at all distances, which cannot be provided by the laser vision correction. So we can go for this type of surgeries of lens-based uh, surgery for treatment. You already mentioned that means the advantage and disadvantage in the same time. Can you finish it by what is the limitations? 
limitations is the selection criteria. I do believe there, there, you have a, a long list of selection criteria and checklist to be fulfilled before selecting these lenses. And the most important that the patient should understand that we're trying to mimic the natural crystalline lens. And this is not a fully accommodative lens as the crystalline lens, it's pseudo accommodative lens. So the patient must understand this lens. And I do believe these lenses are for genius or for smart people. They should understand this technology. Otherwise, these people will not be happy with, uh, with this lens uh, as long as even the surgery is quite perfect, but this, sometimes the, the subjects are not happy. So they should understand this. Uh, thank Ahmed. you, Dr. Ahmed. Yeah. The, uh, those, those patients that they are not eligible for trifocal, now we are using the IDOF, which is the extended depth. And we are seeing, because it's a, it's a new technology and it's a newly registered in, in UAE at least, so we are trying these lenses for those that they are not eligible from a cornea point of view, that they have a higher order of regions or any, any contraindication for a trifocal. And I found personally that they are very happy for uh, 40 or 45 especially for those that, for example, patients that we have it, we have done a laser-based uh, treatment for them. And now we are running a study and uh, in, 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 in using an EDOF for those patients that they have a, a plus 1.5. And we found that uh, a result is very promising, and especially for those EDOF that they will, the, the company pr promised, uh, promised that they will uh, provide an uh, aid of or extended depth of focus with toric, with the touristy. So it's a promising uh, technology. Uh, thank you, Dr. Safan. Now we will uh, go now, to uh, the uh, next. Uh, yes, Dr. Just Mazin, yes. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, Dr. Safan uh, mentioned a very important point, uh, which is that aid of can be used even if the cornea has high order aberrations, which are abnormal. Now, I would like to hear the, uh, is that right, Saf Dr. Safwan? Yes. Did you say that? Yes, it's right. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I'd like to hear the same, the, uh, the, the opinion about the same point from Dr. Ahmed Asaf and Dr. Arthur Cummings about this point, whether IDOF is very safe whenever the high order operations, for example, the RMS is 0 0.6 or not. Uh, okay, so there's a question. Yeah, Dr. Ahmed, and Dr. Arthur, please. Be, I, I'm very cautious to implant these lenses in irregular cornea, still cautious to implant EDOF lens in, uh, in uh, highly irregular corneas. Sometimes you find the, the cornea is a marginal. It's, it's not the, the candidate or the eye is not very well can, uh, eligible for trifocal or multifocal lens. For example, a little bit of coma or some spherical aberrations higher than normal for the cornea so in the, of a specific eye. So at this look, some, at this time I might implant the EDOF lens or after laser vision correction, previous laser vision correction provided that the uh, ablation profile is 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 uh, is good, or the uh, standard patient profile is large, and the optic zoom is large, and there is no too much induced abrasion at the corneal level. But for example, sometimes maybe RK, as the, the number of RKs are less than eight, maybe four, six, or eight. Maybe I will consider either lens. But in highly irregular corneas. I think maybe we can add on, uh, I will go for the add-on lens, like the extra focus lens of Morsher with small uh, pupil aperture lenses. And I've planted a couple of these lenses in some patients with highly regular corneas for treatment of bisbyopia, and they are quite happy. Dr. Arthur, you are having any other of, uh, comments, please? Yeah, Mazen, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think one of our biggest problems at the moment is our lens classifications are not clear. EDOF is too broad a term. EDOF in my book covers the pinhole, the IC8, and of course that's a fabulous lens in an aberrated cornea, no problem. Then there's a new lens from Alcon called the Vividi, which is yes. a wavefront shaping lens. That's from fabulous lens in a complicated eye, no problem. Yes. But my experience and most people's experience is for a diffractive EDOF, they probably are less tolerant than a diffractive multi uh, trifocal. So. My personal experience is I would stay away in a corner with a lot of aberrations. I would stay away from diffractive lenses, whether they're trifocal or, or um, EDOF. I, th I think it's the, the mode in which the EDOF works is the issue. That's right, so, right. So, uh, yeah. uh, so, you, prefer, so you, do, you don't prefer to go for EDOF even if there is a high order. No, 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 this is not the EDOF that, that Arthur, uh, uh, you, Arthur, it's, it's, uh, 
it's a very specific because you are spe uh, specifying the type of Adolf. We need to understand that because here uh, I didn't uh, classify the Adolf. Uh, the Adolf that we are using is not the um, uh, uh, the one that you mentioned. That uh, it's, it's refractive. A, the diffractive. Uh, it's a refractive. Diffractive. You mean. It's, yeah, it's not a diffractive form of Adolf. Yeah. No, yeah. we are not using the diffractive form of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when we are saying that we can use the non-diffractive form of it in a high, uh, uh, high order abrasions corneal, it's not, it's not an unselective. No, it's a selective. So which one that we need to select? When we have an inferior comma, vertical comma, yes, we can. But when we have a high trefoil, no, we can. So... So it is here, it's a highly selective, but the, the issue is that it needs a lot of discussion because corneal, high order abrasions, corneal waverfront analysis, it's, a, it's an art. So we need to analyze that, that case for those patients especially. And for those that they have a high demand and they cannot afford monovision and they have a high order abrasions, it's a, that's right, it's a limited number of patients but we have it in our practice. Uh, I think the non-diffractive EDOF, it can be one of the solution. It's still under process. It's, we, we are just doing few cases and we are seeing that I'm saying it's a promising technology that we can depend on it. If we are seeing that their uh, intermediate vision to near means that 40 to 45 improve and it not affect the distance vision. That's my point of view. Thank you, Dr. Safan. Uh, can just move to uh, another point. We are having the camera in lay, and uh, I think Dr. Mazen also mentioned another type. So I want Dr. Willink, uh, Dr. Arthur. Rahit, if you Arthur, can. Arthur. Arthur is the one who is okay. In Dr. Lace, Mazen, the because he's a share person, he can select with me anyone to answer the question. Please, yeah. Dr. Arthur, you want to give us yeah. a very and short. Then, and then Rohit. And then Rohit. We will hear from him. Okay, so Rohit so Arthur... and Arthur. Yes, please go ahead, Dr. So, Dr. Sorry, Mazen. Dr. Mohamed. Uh, 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 so, uh, please, Arthur, would you please uh, um, talk just a, very briefly about the inlays for the press uh, yeah, About the concept the presbyte eligibility, presbyte. advantage, and limitations. We, we need a very yeah. short, in one minute, please. Yeah. Okay, in one minute, inlays were very promising, but have turned out to be very disappointing because of their biocompatibility. Um, some of the Processes like pinhole made a lot of sense, but also cost people in terms of light. So I'm afraid that for most people, inlays are a very short-term solution and most inlays are removed again. I have one very small experience for 60 cases. We did it in part of a clinical trial, doing an inlay with corneal tissue. And that was very, very promising. So I think human collagen or human corneal inlays are going to be possible for the future. But the synthetic inlays, I'd be, I have my doubts. Professor Shady, what do you think? Right. Uh, I'm, I was not directly involved with the inlays. Uh, the reason being, uh, we did start with a colleague of mine and we had, uh, I don't know whether it's the, the geographical or genetic factors which was different because we thought the results were good when we tried. Many of them had uh, quite bad inflammation. And... Uh, I mean, you know, even when we had to remove it, it yes. was quite a difficult one. So it was, and we thought that it is just not the one which we would try because it's just giving a pinhole effect. Uh, but a colleague of mine, uh, not colleague, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh, he is in Bangalore and he did a lot of uh, uh, smile lenticule based inlays to uh, build it. And like you mentioned, the future is going to be additive technologies. Uh, the only challenge now is that uh, uh, that even today, if you want to take a lenticule and implant it, it still comes under uh, the whole uh, eye bank uh, rules because it's a uh, it's a tissue. And with COVID being here around, there's always a challenge about uh, what you transmit. And uh, you know, in fact, uh, just for everybody here, that uh, the the work which I was doing is to find the the COVID-based receptors in the whole eye. I dissected the whole eye, and this is something which is very interesting. All of you should know, even though it's not part of the... The corneal epithelium and the stroma has the same amount of receptors 
of ACE2 and catapsin related ones where the virus attaches exactly the same as what you see in lungs or the nasal mucosa. So we just cannot take it very lightly. And we took some seven eyeballs and dissected every layer by layer to retina and the retina has the least. So any inlays we do uh, has to be now with a very strict protocol that it does not, uh, I mean, just like uh, Arthur, you know, once upon a time, the British and we were worried about the mad cow uh, uh, disease. And, you know, we were worried about what is going to be transplanted on the corneal buttons. I think exactly the same thing. But uh, I'm not a big fan of, uh, Dr. Mazam, I'm not a big fan of uh, inlays at this point of time. Okay, can I go back just the question? So, can I, if according to the division that Dr. Mazam mentioned, so the concept behind this one, it is either, as far as I know, there is one is depending on a binhole like effect, one of them, right? Yes. Okay, and the other one, it's so it is, I want this one to be clear just, for the, uh, the, the participant. So, they are depending what is the concept of behind of the camera itself. So, the other one, the, the camera camera's pinhole. pinhole. The Alitex human human collagen and the but, raindrop that is not on the market anymore was based on spherical aberration, like yes. Dr. Albayati was talking about yes. with, with that the laser can create. That's and right. Spherical aberration gives you a lot of depth of focus with a yes. very small compromise on visual quality. So it's yes. a very nice solution. And the beauty of the corneal inlays, especially those that are human collagen, is when you remove them, there's no footprints. So they are truly reversible. Sometimes when you remove the, the raindrop for six months, nine months, sometimes even longer, it was a footprint where you could see this inflammatory Great. response still. Yeah, uh, Dr. Arthur, we, I removed personally a few of them. Uh, we had um, uh, one surgeon here in Dubai and he did around 25 and then he stopped. There was a, there was a lot of complaint. So uh, I had to remove that. The main issues is that the centration and unfortunately most of the surgeons that they, are, they did it, they, they are not concerned, considered a, a very important things in all presbyopic treatment is that this presbyopic treatment should be applied on the visual axis and uh, how to apply the inlay on a visual axis. And uh, when I, when, what I saw is that when you are removing this inlay, the trace of it will stay uh, decentered to the visual axis and uh, annoying the patient even after removal, that then I stopped removing them because the patients start to complain more and uh, uh, that's one of the important issues that makes even uh, the, removal, the removing the inlay as a, a problem for the patients. Uh, I'd, like to, uh, ask, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Arthur, uh, uh, what about the uh, late uh, hypophic shift with the camera inlay? Have you experienced such complication or side effects about the late hypophic shift or do you target myopia at the time of implantation or do you do you just do it sequential methods or what? Do you target a little bit of myopia for the eye implanted with the camera inlay? So what we did years ago when we were doing it is we were, out, we were advised to target minus 075. But in all the time, I over three years that I used camera, I implanted 13. So I was very, very slow with them. And I've removed of camera only probably about three or four. But of the raindrop, I implanted 18 over three or four years and I removed at least half of them now. So I think any any artificial inlay, we're going to be bitten at some point. The cornea doesn't like those kinds of foreign bodies. But what I can tell you is with the human collagen inlays, like Susan Jacob is doing in India, like yes. um, we're doing with Allotex, which is from an eye bank, human, human mm -hmm. cornea and collagen that's been eye banked. Mm -hmm. um, the compatibility is extremely good. And I have removed a couple, not for any incompatibility issues, but only for um, patient satisfaction issues. And from the moment you remove the inlay, the cornea is back to where it was before you started. So there's there's no footprint. No so I think that's really got a, a, a it's really got a place. So Dr. Arthur, okay, one, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Dr. Ray. Yes. Just and one thing I wanted to add is uh, the whole reaction of inlays depends on your ocular surface uh, disease itself. The reason is when you have a, a very bad ocular surface the corneal keratocytes and the corneal nerves have a lot of dendritic cells. And minute you put anything foreign in it, the first thing it does is it explodes 100 times more than a person who has a good ocular surface. So we realized that a healthy ocular surface 
there's no footprint of anything. There's no fibrosis. And that is one thing which I think many times inlays has been told that you don't need to worry about your dry eyes because you're not cutting the nerves or not doing anything. So in fact, I feel the ocular surface plays a very important role in inlays than any other procedure because minute you put in your reaction of keratocytes is completely different compared to the ocular surface. So I think that if somebody wants to do an uh, inlays, the ocular surface has to be perfect or you have to make it perfect for at least three to six months, make your person absolutely healthy and then probably, and the best way to do it is uh, you give them an OSDI score or a speed questionnaire, which tells you what is your status. I think it's very, very, very difficult to have a patient completely ocular service. Everyone is having a, some sort of that. So it would be very difficult. So now let's go to a, a scenario or cases presentation. I will present with, with you a case and I want your opinion. Before I take the opinion or your uh, uh, I mean, your input about this case, we will take uh, like a uh, voting from our colleagues or uh, participants. Uh, the first case is uh, a 41 year old uh, is working with a computer, have difficulty in near vision. Is yeah, can, you, uh, can you share the screen, please? Yeah, I think that you share the screen. You want to me to share the screen, okay. Yeah, at least we can read it uh, um, in, in more. Uh, okay, okay, we will take I, our I will do, I will do so far. Now you can see. Yeah. Or you want me to enlarge it also? Enlarge it, I think that's better. Okay. So this is the case here, uh, a 41 year old uh, and working with a computer, having difficulty in near vision, uh, visual activity for distance six, six, uh, both of eyes. Uh, visual activity for near is J6 corrected to J1 by plus one added. And patient doesn't want to use an eyeglass or contact lens. So what is the best solution in this case? Can we have now the, uh, Mr. John, the questions for the participants to answer, then we can have the idea or the comment from our uh, here. Do um, you have the refraction, Mohammed? very. What's the refraction for this patient? Because that's very important. Is he hyperopic or what? Uh, he, he, is, he is normal, Dr. Osama, without any... No, yeah, okay. So here, yeah, what is the best solution in this case? Um, can you answer even the, the one, uh, I mean, the speakers here as panelists? I think uh, we have okay. to add another option, which is just glasses. <laughs> ah, okay. I didn't do that, actually, because he don't want, I said in that question, he don't want, want, his, his he doesn't want to wear a glass. He don't want a glass. Atlas, it is there. So this is the question. Okay. So can we have the, the uh, I mean, the answers, Mr. John? What is the The answer is does not have the glasses. I would agree with Dr. Mazim uh, that, you know, the glasses would be the option for him because Laser yeah, but I mean, this is the the, uh, the patient is asking that I don't want to use a glass or contact lens. That's why we keep without, we didn't put a glass. So if he, the patient doesn't want. So after we can discuss if this is only suitable for glasses or contact lens and he cannot do the other, then maybe this is the other solution, can convince him. But as a patient, he don't want the glass or contact lens. So here, the, the, this is the, the answer of the, our participants. The laser based correction is in 57. We are having laser based correction in 30%. And camera inlay, we are having uh, about uh, 40, uh, 14%. So, mm. now, what do you think uh, here, dear uh, colleagues? I want to take your opinion. Let mm. us start with uh, Dr. Uh, Mazin. What do you think? Well, I think that uh, uh, th there are, of course, other factors that should be studied, like the uh, uh, high order abrasions, angle kappa, for example. But for such uh, plus one, uh, I don't do any of those. Uh, I just try to convince the patient to stay on his glasses because it is just plus one. And if we go for the laser based, it will be, uh, a tra uh, I mean, temporary. Couple of years, then there will be a change. So uh, I don't do any of those. Okay, Dr. Uh, Rohit, 
Dr. Dr. Mazen, do you mean a change because the patient will outgrow it or a change in that the the no, physiological not changes in yeah, I mean yeah, I mean the regret, the presbyopia will increase. Yeah. I, well, let me I do want to add one thing. I know I'm cutting in front of but I want to speak to that. I I have uh, between 0.5 and 0.75 of monovision and I want to just tell anyone who doesn't use this that it is incredibly valuable and incredibly useful. And as long as I know not to be greedy and want more, and I don't mind keeping a pair of plus ones in my pocket, I really have to say how incredibly pleased I am at 60 years of age. So I'm not one of these 50 year olds, or, but I'm 60 years old. And I wanna tell you that I really love and appreciate the half diopter or maybe at most three quarter diopters that I have. So I think the patient may outgrow it, but only to the point where they'll need the plus ones for, for the reading and, and uh, occasional items. Okay, doctor, but uh, uh, the patient is emetropic and he has plus one add just for reading. So what are you going to do for this patient? The well, I, yeah. you are asking yeah. who? Basically, Sam. one thing, uh, sorry, for, yeah. Sam, yes, I Sam. comment about something really, because 41, I don't believe 41, emetropic, yes. you need a exactly. plus one really, so it doesn't go yeah, together. Exactly. But I'm sure it's you have something hyperobic. So you need to be cyclopelagic refraction for this one. If it's hyperobic, yeah. try to use a plus lenses, binocular, and, and try to try monovision in him and see how is it, because I don't believe in someone in 41, he's struggling with near, he needs a plus one really. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, just one, yes. one thing that I agree fully with Dr. Mazen that the progression is one of the challenges in these cases, in, in, the, in this age, sorry. So uh, yeah. if we don't have the technology that can go through uh, uh, adding and, and plus one, definitely you, the patient might have plus 0.75 as a hyperopic uh, in, in 41 or plus 0.5 in these cases. Yes, I do agree. So. Uh, if I don't have the technology for laser that can add plus two in a non-dominant eye and plus one in a dominant eye, then I will not do anything. Now, testing this patient for this kind of technology using a, a trifocal lens, putting a plus one add to what he has as a refraction, let us say, for example, plus 0.75 with add one in a dominant and plus 0.75 with add two in a non-dominant, if the patient accepted, then we can do it. The plus two in the non-dominant will keep the uh, vision, near vision, active until age of 50 to 51 or 52. Patient should accept the fact that it is a progressive issues and we might be in need to do an enhancement surgery as uh, one of the important sessions that uh, Professor Rohit uh, Shetty, he did it in, in India. It was a very lovely, nice, session, if he, if he remember what he did through the different technology, he, we need to do a, 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 an enhancement. Patient should agree that this enhancement might done after seven years. So what we do you don't think? have this technology to, to start with. In this case, we cannot do anything, only glasses. If we have this technology that can do addition one in one eye and plus two in the non-dominant eye, that's we, we can proceed. And I have a lot of cases and I, I did it and I'm doing it. Okay, I'm Dr. Doing Rahit, can you comment about this one, please? Dr. Rahit, yeah. um, you have see, experience about it. See, uh, I, have, I use uh, two technologies for this. Uh, one is uh, the Baoshan norm, the SupraCore, and the, uh, the Schwend uh, uh, yeah. technology. Ma but my Prisby Max. Can you can, yeah, Prisby Prisby Max. But take home point from this, which I want to bring very clear is yeah. okay. The patient may be demanding, yes, but I had many patients where when initially we used to do it on an emetro and you don't really get what you want because there'll always be some line drop in for the distance vision. The patient may do see it and yes. the patient has to accept that there is going to be some issues with yes. your distance vision. I think that message has to be clearly told with this exactly. case. Yes, sir. if he accepts the, the trifocality at a contact lens user, mean a trial, that trial is a crucial for this treatment. 
So but if he accepted for the distance vision, then then that's all. But sir, what happens is uh, if you want to give him a trial, yes. it has to be for the three to four months time, because there's an always a thing about neuroadaptation. Sometimes the patient may accept it very quickly. Sometimes they may not. If they don't accept, then you have to give for at least three to four months. That means this patient may not be the ideal one for a laser correction. But like I like you said, contact lens trial. You given them enough time. You explain to them there could be loss of lines, because yeah. to be very frank, we don't have a technology today, Doctor Mahmud. This is what the, the the message should be that you can guarantee them that it will be six by six or twenty by twenty and J one at the end of everything. So we have to be very clear. The, the challenge for uh, laser vision correction is always going to be an emetro. Okay, think so I think I think I, I will agree about the comments of Dr. Mazer, his talk. So in this case, the best way is to keep the patient in the glass. Uh, in the best, I mean, this is the, the most important. If the patient insisting and he accept all the others, uh, I mean, that he will uh, really, there will be a loss of one line for distance as the, all the other things that the doctor mentioned, then we can go for uh, a, a laser correction. Is that correct? Correct? Yeah, yes. Dr. Ayat. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Yeah. Mazin, you agree on that? Because yeah. uh, with me yeah. now, we have to, we have to tell, yes. yani, we have to tell our participants that we agree on certain point about the case and you yeah. are okay. So, yes, uh, now the second also. case, can we go? Yeah, Dr. Imad also, thank you. Uh, can we go now to the second case? Uh, Dr. Mazza, if you want, yes, to control this one, just I will show you can read and, um, okay, go ahead, Dr. Mazza. Okay, so uh, this patient is a 45 year old. Uh, the distance visual acuity is 6'6", six, six, both eyes with minus three diopter sphere without cylinder. For the near vision, it is very good with uh, G1. The uh, anterior segment, no cataract. Okay, to get rid of eyeglasses. Yeah, very good question. What is the solution in this case? Okay, now, let, let us now let's let's first ask, let us ask our uh, uh, participants their yes. opinion. Okay, yeah. we are having lens based, we have laser based, we have camera LA. Um, I forget to do something. Okay, so remind me, Mr. John, whenever we finish, to have another to ask the, the, the participants about their opinion after our discussion. So let us go here. What is the best solution for this case? Okay, let us count for 10 seconds. Now, for this, for the sake of time, uh, I'd like to ask uh, every one of the panelists just one sentence. What do you do? You may say lens-based. You may say laser-based. You may say uh, mini monovision, for example. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Imad. I would go for laser extended depth of focus, laser monovision. Uh, uh, Professor Rohit. Rohit. Sorry, there were some connection issues here. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, go ahead, Doctor Rohit. Uh, so, Rohit, uh, what do you do? Just one sentence. I will do a. <clears throat> I'll do a monovision laser. Uh, monovision laser without extended depth of focus or uh, changing the sphericity of the cornea or any type of that. Uh, no, at this point of time, just a monovision laser would do. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor Asaf? Laser based with the extended depth of focus by aspheric profile ablation in the non dominant eye and mini minimal vision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Samuel, what do you think? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer laser as the others did, but I'm so um, worried about how 
good this person's near vision is that I would have to also entertain trifocal uh, implants if they're really serious. If I'm following your question literally where they wanna get rid of their glasses, I believe that might be the only way of truly doing it. It's, it's really easy to make a minus three unhappy with their near vision um, afterwards. Okay, so, so you don't do, for example, um, mini monovision or monovision or extended depth of focus, laser vision correction? I, I do, but I'm, I'm mm -hmm. taking your question literally about wanting to get rid of glasses. And I don't think that's capable of doing it as well as the trifocal implants. And so, so what you would have, do, okay. so, what, so what you would select here, Doctor, as well, what is your solution for this? Guy? I'm gonna go with laser, uh, but that implies that, that implies that I've been able to convince this person not to be so greedy as expect the near vision that they have preoperatively. That's the only way I can answer the question. Okay, Safwan. Now, Mazen, that, that patient should uh, underwent the, the uh, trial of the contact lens. Now, in, in my trial of the contact lens, those patients should understand well that they will lose one line or the golden near vision J1, they will lose it. They, the, uh, the target should be uh, J3. So if they accept, I will go through a micro monovision plus extended depth of, fo of, of focus. That extended depth of focus will go through a uh, cold micro extended means that there is um uh, uh, for example the eye with because he for example he's in in 45 and he's in need for um, a plus 1.5 in one in the dominant or plus 1.25 in the dominant and i will go to two or 2.25 in the non-dominant so here my idea as someone will say that those patients they have something called that they cannot lose the gold the gold that they have in their in their hand is the near vision. So they don't need to use, lose it. So I will try with a multi type of trifocal contact lens uh, with them one day or okay. th two days or one week until they will reach a standard that they accepted. If they accept it, then I will go to the lens base, which is micro mono plus- L Laser and, based, you mean? Laser based. laser based. Yes, laser based. For sure, laser uh, based. Yeah. This is a laser. Yeah. 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 Uh, so Marzen, this is me, 10 years ago, at the age of 49, I had, I was minus three, both eyes, I had laser vision, right eye zero, left eye minus 150, I'm 58 years old now, it's still the best thing ever since sliced bread, so I say laser vision, either monovision, if you can accept it, and if you can't accept monovision entirely, then mm -hmm. go for some sort of blended vision with a asphericity in the reading eye, yeah. mm -hmm. laser based. Nice. That's what you said. Yeah, Osama? Yeah, definitely. It's just uh, monovision, but he needs to accept it like one and a half monovision. If it's like low, like 0.75, he will not be happy very soon. So if accept if yeah. accepted good level of monovision, like one and a half or some, or 1.75, that's the way to go. But if he doesn't happy, I don't go for lens surgery at this, this age whatsoever. I will send it somewhere else. So I tell uh -huh. him Great. at this age, I don't want to do lens surgery. It can be done, but I don't do it at 45%. Okay, so the final question for all the panelists that uh, 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 nobody agrees for lens-based in this situation, correct? Yes. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Mazen, one, you can the, the questions that those patients... Yes, Safwan, sorry. This, those patients, definitely apart from uh, Arthur, maybe Arthur, he has uh, a good uh, background, no knowledge, and this, uh, he's a scientist. So he has, uh, his brain is preoccupied, but those patients, uh, they don't agree the monovision. So it's uh, very easily. So that's what, that's what I learned from my experience. So when you are applying 1.75, for example, one eye and minus 0.25 in one eye, they will not agree. They will not accept it. As you said, the tolerance uh, uh, level for them is very difficult to reach. That's why when we add the extended depth of focus by a laser, it will be much accepted, it means that the accepted group will be larger than the monovision group. Okay, thank you, Safwan. So, uh, you. Dr. Mohammed. Uh, okay, can we have case? the question, repeat the question now for our uh, participants so to see if they are changing their mind? Anyway, it uh, is a very good class. idea. Yeah, okay. Okay, can you, can you show the question again, St. John? Yes, again. So Thank now let us go. So most of us, I don't know, but let us uh, vote again. Okay, we are having only five seconds, please. So we are 
And I would ask uh, Mazen, after your permission, if you can have a very short answer because we are going to list still more uh, uh, cases and we want to finish in a time for your sake and for our participants. Very short, please, as much. Okay, if you can get the result, Mr. John, for this case. Yeah. Okay, most so cases, now, so the people, they are, are yeah, so they understand most of them before we are having 2% camera elite, no more. Still, some people, they are leaving in lens-based correction. If we are having anyone and he is having a raised hand, we can hear for them from them why they are still want to do a lens-based correction. Okay? So let's yeah. go, Dr. Mazen, to the next case. And please, this yeah. is the case for you. I will show you and you can go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Okay, Mazen. 43-year-old patient, visual acuity 6.6 six with, uh -huh, he is hyperopic plus 2.5 without astigmatism. Okay. Uh, what, what about the uh, near so, vision? Uh, near vision here, I think it was uh, G, um, G, so one, what we have got this. G6. What? Six, sorry, G6. G6, yeah, G6, yeah, G6, uh, yeah, what I'm saying, okay. G6. I forget uh, just to write. Uh, uh, no addition, no addition. Yeah, I mean, with plus with plus two point five. The same, okay. Yeah, okay. So anterior segment. No cataract. No cataract. Okay. Uh, here, patient wants to be treated also of the glass as usual. Our question: uh, What to do? Okay. So the question to the audience now. I, I, the question, I remember the addition was one point five, and uh, the visual like the, the J one J six, and the sacroblastic refraction. Uh, there is no cycle because this is okay. Let, let's say, let, let's assume, Osama, that this is after cycloplegic refraction. Yeah. Let's assume. Because that's very important for this age, really. Yeah, of course. Okay. Okay. So, what is the best solution in this case, also lens based, laser based, or camera inlay? And just to remind you, there is no cataract in this case, and he is, let's say, hyperopic, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, let us see what is the result, John. Mm. Uh, almost equal, almost yeah, equal. Yeah, lens-based laser. and laser-based correction, almost equal, and we have camera LA 5%. So, Dr. Mazen, go ahead, and you can start now from Dr. Osama. Yes, Dr. Osama, please, what do you do? So basically for this one, if it's cycloblastic, is very matching, I go for laser surgery, really and maybe tiny monovision, not much. Okay. But it depends on the patient what you want really, but I don't go for lens if it's, because usually with hyperopic, uh, usually they have also better uh, depth of focus for after treatment. So they carry it better than the myopic patient. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's because of the steep cornea in the center, which gives some asphericity and depth of focus. Okay, but uh, do, do you uh, tell the patient that even the hyperopic treatment may regress in the future? That's why the cycloplegic is very, very important. That's why I tell you early, the most important part. But usually, I don't see big regression, but it's maybe a mild one. But you could enhance it, really. So it's not a, a big deal. But it's, uh, I think it's, it's the multifocal. They have more disadvantage at his age. OK, do, do you do some overcorrection? Uh, a mild one, if you want to do. But depends on the cornea curvature also. What's the cornea curvature of this patient? Uh, let's assume that the curvature allows you. So do you do? So I may example, go for 0.75. I do monovision, try uh -huh, lens, monovision. and then okay. maybe 0.75 uh, uh, monovision. Okay, great, uh, Arthur. So I agree with Osama, except if the patient doesn't like blended vision at all, and he definitely wants to be glasses free, then I would for a hyperope, a young hyperope, I'd have no problem putting in a trifocal. My different story completely. But a young hyperope, these are the patients who are most satisfied with, with trifocals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lens-based, uh, uh, Arthur. Uh, Ahmed? If he doesn't accept. Ah, if, he, he accept uh -huh. yeah. if he doesn't accept. Well, uh, this, uh, this patient play, uh, is situated in the gray zone between the lens phase and laser base. My approach in this case, I would ask the patient uh, if he wants or she wants a radical solution or just a temporary solution. If uh, the patient accepts for just a temporary solution as if we are turning the clock back 
uh, for 10 years uh, to transfer the patient from 43 to 33, let's say, I will go for the laser based with the micro monovision because the ablation profile with the hypropia uh, improves the depth of focus and enables the patient to, to read uh, at least at the intermediate distance. And of course, if we do some uh, sort of my, uh, myopia, targeting myopia of minus 0.75 in the dominant eye, non dominant eye, this patient will be on the moon, will be very happy with the quality of vision and the uh, uh, spectacle independence. But if the patient mm -hmm. wants radical solution, Solution, I would go for the trifocal lens, as Arthur mentioned, and keep in mind that we have a new technology, we have the fine vision of uh, physiology, we have the panoptics of, we have quite exciting technology that uh, provide excellent quality of vision and excellent functionality for these young subjects. Uh, Safwan? Well, I, I do agree, Dr. Mazin, with uh, Dr. Ahmed, that, that uh, the challenge here is in that and the hyperopic uh, issues is that sometimes they are not accepting uh, the temporary because they know that it's a progressing. And if the patient agreed with the temporary and we can enhance the, the treatment again, and uh, he doesn't have, um, um, uh, he's, he's not a diabetic and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cycloplegic agreed with, the, with our treatment, uh, because sometimes uh, the, the challenge of the laser in these cases is that when the cycloplegic shows a 4.5 and and he the the author of shows 2.5 and he's not accepting uh, the, the 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 treatment over so when we will when you will treat them as a laser uh, th two three months he will end up with another two two point five so that's that's all if it's excluded and the the cycloplegic was fine with it and the patient accepts the tri uh, the monovision or trifocality with extended depth, then I will go, go according to the uh, patient acceptance. If he needs a temporary, then I will go with either monovision or uh, uh, micro monovision and extended depth. If not, then he needs a radical treatment, then I will go with the trifocal, as Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Arthur said, we have an, an, an excited okay. senses now and we can, we can do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, somewhere? And I have a comment also here, one sec. Yeah, About yeah, yeah. It's not a temporary solution because his, uh, his distance will be getting worse. So you need to understand this patient. If you don't do any surgery, his distance will be also worse. So it's not a temporary solution even as a temporary. So it's a plastic it's solution for his distance. For no, means, no, no, but yeah. But is, that's what I mean. Temporary to some limit, but he's much better than what he is if he didn't do anything. You know what I mean? But they're Talking. concerned about the, temp the near vision more than the, t the distance vision. Okay, the, uh, Someone? Yeah, that's good, yeah. So yeah, for, for me, absolutely. I'm gonna lean towards the lens-based solution with trifocals. I'm concerned about the longer healing of hyperopes with laser. I'm concerned about hitting the correct lens for them when they finally need cataract surgery. Um, down the road. And um, I have to say again, just like, just like Arthur, I could not be more pleased with my monovision. I have to tell you, if someone offered me right now to change my vision by even 1%, I, I don't think I would accept it. That's how happy I am. And I only have about minus 75. So I surrender to using the plus ones uh, when I need them. And I just couldn't be not more, more happy. For me, the trick, uh, the trick where we are now is just not to be too greedy with, uh, with patients, where you try to give them all and end up with the lower satisfaction. Great, uh, Rohit. I think, Dr. Mazin, the experiment of the contact lens, whether it's in, in monovision or in, 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 in trifocality and ex the good explanation for the patients. And then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the cycloplegic action, especially for those hyperopic, is a mandatory for those patients, uh, especially when they, they need to understand that what we are doing on a laser base, it's a temporary issues. And what we are doing on the, on the lens base is a, is a permanent for distance and near. Uh, by the way, there is a special tolerance test that should be dead, uh, done um, for the blended vision um, uh, or the press beyond. So in the clinic, without using the contact lenses, just by the foropter or the spectacles, you can, or, or the frame, trial frame, you oh, yeah. can uh, check the tolerance of the patient and uh, how much difference he can tolerate. Yeah. So this is another point to, to point it out. So Rohit, yes, please. Um, I agree with uh, most of the points discussed. The only, <clears throat> I would, uh, at this point of time, 
being a hyperop and lens being clear, I would give him an option of uh, laser based uh, as my first option. But I would decide not to do a laser based if I feel that his curvature at the end of the procedure is going to be like a keratoconic one. Yeah. Because then you're going to mess up everything. Because if, yes. his, if his curvature is 45, 46, mm -hmm. or, uh, and if you end up in close to 48, 49, mm -hmm. you'll end up with a terrible amount of uh, spherical aberrations. And uh, mm -hmm. that would create a huge impact in his quality of vision. So ultimately, even if you give him a uh, 20 by 20 J1, uh, it's all about how good the quality of vision is if he's driving. And that depends a lot on his pupil size, especially at this point of time. So my decision is based on what is going to be the post-op change in his curvature based mm -hmm. on this uh, pre-op uh, case. And that is going to be a very important factor to decide uh, to go for a laser blended vision or uh, for the, uh, for the uh, trifocal lenses. Okay, great. Now, um, you highlighted a very good point. So what is the highest cutoff value of the K reading that you don't go beyond after hyperopia, post-op? I mean, uh, it shouldn't be more than 48. It shouldn't be more than 49. Um, uh, uh, hyperopic, we don't have uh, 48 and 49. Usually they're... No, no, they're no, no. Just, uh, uh, Dr. Safwan, no. Uh, Pre-op, for example, 44. And we are going to treat the patient. Yeah. So uh, what is the uh, highest K reading, post-op K reading that you accept? Otherwise, you don't go for the operation. The post-op should be uh, at most 48, 49. W what do you do? Uh, optically, what yes. I, was, this is, uh, I, I mean, this is purely anecdotal. What I've been told uh, by people working on optical work is yeah. human beings, normal human beings can tolerate yeah. up to close to around 50, 52 mm -hmm. uh, curvature changes. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, nobody has really tested it. But 47 to 48 would be a very ideal way to cut off. That's one. Mm -hmm. But that also heavily depends on your pupil size. If your mm -hmm. pupil size is very small and it's got uh, like a pinhole, Mm -hmm. then uh, you are just going to uh, virtually take care of, uh, irrespective of your curvature, is going to take care of everything. So I think it depends a lot on your pupil also. Uh, uh, now I come to this point, which is the, uh, the last uh, thing to say. The spherical aberration does not depend only on K readings. It depends as well on Q value. So there is, an, uh, let's say, inverse relationship with the K readings, okay? And there is a proportional relationship with the uh, Q value. So sometimes a K reading of 48 does not produce the same uh, uh, spherical aberration as, uh, for example, another 48 and another patient with different Q value. So it is uh, uh, based on subject to subject. That's right, Dr. Mazen. And we need to differentiate between two things that a positive spherical abrasion that we are inducing when we are treating a myop and a negative spherical the abrasion negative. when we are treating yeah. a hyperop. So yeah. here, it's a, it's a totally different. So I need just to comment right. on, on uh, Rahit that the issues is that when, when you are end up with a those we, we patients that you. they have a high hyperop. Uh, so oh, far, sorry. So far, your yeah. internet is connected, so it's interrupted, so uh, your voice is not clear. Uh, would you please repeat the no, question? Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. still, no, it's not a question. Uh, it's a comment. Now you are hearing yeah, me? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, it's still now you are hearing me? Okay, I will... I will change Dr. Safan, I think we can keep this comment later on because your voice is still interrupted. Uh, yeah. So for now, saving up the time... Is there anything? Is there a, a, now I, I, you can hear me? Going and coming. The problem is going and coming. Okay, let's okay. go. Okay, so I was talking about the 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 spheric, the positive spherical abrasion that we are no, uh, no, using so it when 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 we are inducing. Okay, done. That's your it. your voice is cut. It's not clear. Uh, interrupted. Okay. So one word we are hearing, the other one is not. Done. So let's keep for the next. Uh, uh, let us have the question again for the our uh, participants. So then we can go to the uh, next case. What is the best solution in this case? 
So after this, what you will do? Okay. A good way, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you. To, to uh, see whether they change their mind or not. Okay, before we are having 50 and 43, let's say. And uh, now one, two, three, four, five. So you can show us the result now. So let us be very fast. So Dr. Mazin, if you allow me, please. Also, we need to be a little bit fast. We are still having four cases and we are having many questions. So, <laughs> so now it's more, we have more. The same. <laughs> Nobody so changed is, the mind. So, okay, but it is, you know, it's acceptable because we are having, you know, if you want now the final comment from you, Dr. Mazen. So the first, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would go about the result. Well. Yeah, uh, um, personally, I would go for the laser-based with some mini monovision. And uh, if the patient does not accept, then maybe trifocal is the best. So, so this is, I think, the most of, of our patients, yeah. they agree on this point, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, so I'm going so, to go fast. And in each uh, coming case, I'm going to, uh, to ask only three panelists. Not all panelists, okay? For the sake okay, of Okay, this one, it what will be, uh, okay, no problem. If everybody want to share, but we need a very, uh, everyone, not more than 10 seconds, 15 seconds, please. So let us go to the fourth case, please. This is, yeah, go ahead. 50 Victor. year, okay. Okay. Uh, Plano. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Plus 2.5 for near. This is a 50, okay. Okay, no cataract. No cataract. Okay. Question? So what is the best solution? Can we have the answer, Dr. Mr. John? Can you show the questions, please? Okay. Okay, so within five seconds, the please. Can you see the result fast, if you have it? Uh, lens based lens correction based. 53 is most, so laser base uh, 36 and 11 camera elite. So let's go and see what is the. the uh, result. Imad, let's start with Imad. Okay, what to do? So, Imad? So I, I do believe that uh, the, the, the cut point here is what we call the ocular scattered index. We need to be sure that there is no uh, kind of opacity in that lens. If the lens is totally clear, then we can think of a lens of a laser-based micromonovision with uh, a spheric correction. Uh, in case this patient has successfully passed the tolerance test and he is uh, willing uh, about the idea of compromise. So if the criteria fits exactly to the micromonovision laser-based, we will go for it. Otherwise, we can suggest uh, early, uh, or what we call the clear lens extraction with uh, multifocal IOL. Well. Okay, very nice. This is very short. Yeah, we need even Sama. shorter than that. Yeah. <laughs> Osama. I think for the for the near vision, I think you need for lens space, but I don't like to do it. I'm referred to as one of my colleagues. Arthur. I would go with laser, and if they're not happy, I would wait because I don't like doing refractive lens exchange for someone who's 2020 uncorrected. Okay, Safwan. We cannot hear you, Safwan. We cannot hear you. You are muted. Sorry for that. I, no, I, my voice is clear. Yes, yes, yes. yes. The, the issues is that uh, uh, for for the for the for the challenge for this patient is that the six six plano so. Uh, I agree with Dr. Arthur. I will I will go through and I will wait for this patient because this patient might lose one to two lines for when, when when we will do a lens base. So if he agreed that he will lose and he understand that he will lose, then then I will go through. Otherwise, I will wait. I will uh, not wait. do the base. So it's they, still my choice will be lens base, but I will I I I rather wait for a six six uh, to to have uh, any changes in the the distance. Then I will do it. So okay. you will do nothing, Dr. Safa? Yes, I will wait. wait. So wait, okay. okay. Rohit. Rohit. <clears throat> uh, basically, I would look for, uh, in Pentacam, the densitometry, the lens densitometry index, the PNS grading, which gives something which uh, Dr. Mohamed mentioned uh, about whether there is any dysfunctional lens uh, issues out here. Uh, then I, mm, I'm mentally clear that is not a clear lens, but we are trying to do something uh, for the lens which is already getting dysfunctional lens uh, changes. That's the first thing. 
and uh, given an option uh, the laser base would be good but if there is any changes on the lens uh, aberration wise then i would definitely go for the lens based one yeah but can i have the question now before mazen to allow me the patient he don't want to use the glass so how you would wait you would convince him to use the glass till uh, uh, times if the, if the answer of the to support or what now, actually, uh, let, me, let me comment on this. Now, I, I have a, a doubt about the plus 2.5 at this age. I am 50, and my ad is uh, just plus 1.5, 125 is okay for, with me. No, so why plus 2.5? No, no, but you are my own. Okay, I'm not... 54, and I'm now I'm using 2.5, my dear. That's different. Mm -hmm. That depends <laughs> on, on your on your ex, uh, yeah, name. I don't know, but but this is the issues. We don't have patients with 50 and and using 1.5 unless he has a myopic element. So yes. uh, uh, age of above 50 or 50, they they yeah, they used to have th this kind of around plus 2.25 to plus to 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 2.5. No, I, I actually I don't encounter such patients where mm -hmm. 50 years they are emetrop and they use the plus 2.5. Most of my patients are okay with the plus 1.5, 1.75 maximum. So I don't know. I don't want to mention something secret, but my wife, she is using uh, plus 2.5 and she is not around. <laughs> but I will not say what is the age. Okay, let's go for it. <laughs> I, 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 agree with, I agree with Rohit and uh, I just want to say that as a poor man's test, I use the slit lamp to look at someone's lens because you can have, uh, at 50 years old, this is the time where you see a whole range of lens clarities that there are some lenses that do permit six over six vision, but you can tell they're only a few years away from, from trouble. So not, not everyone has the same six over six lens at age 50. And I, I, I look very carefully with the slit lamp uh, to mm -hmm. tell with that. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, we should point. We should ask uh, the patient about the quality of vision. By the way, uh, if the patient is happy with the quality of vision and just want to get rid of his his reading or her reading glasses, this is an issue. Because if the patient is happy with the quality of vision, I won't touch. For example, I won't touch this patient. And I have an aberrometer, by the way, so I will put the patient in front of the aberrometer to see about what a, an idea about the uh, ocular spherical aberration and the coma and the internal abrasions and try to um, uh, analyze the, the, the quality of vision if the patient has some issues with the quality of vision. If the patient has some issues with the internal aberrations, maybe in this situation, I might go for the lens-based surgery in one eye. Uh, I will choose the non-dominant eye uh, because it's quite difficult to hit the emetropia in this patient. It's not not very well guaranteed to hit emetropia in this patient, even with the highest technology we have with the optical biometer. So I think the key factor here is the, uh, as mentioned before, the ocular scatter index, if the if the available in your facility or. Uh, the Pentacamp PNS uh, or the uh, idea about the aberrometer, about the internal aberrations of the patient and the patient's subjective perception of quality of vision. If the patient is happy with the quality of vision, I prefer not to touch this patient. Yeah. Uh, Ahmed, if you, ask, if you allow me to ask you, Ahmed, if this patient you find him is completely free, no cataract, no problem, no refractive error whatsoever, and he don't want to use a glass and he want to get rid of the glass, then what is your options? I mean, what is so? So I will consider this patient as a patient of unrealistic expectation, and this is a, one of the contraindications to do touch to touch this patient with the lens based search. So you will send them to whom, please? To Dr. Mazen or to Dr. Safwan? To Dr. Safwan. I think it's very... No one would touch this patient at all. Because the issue is that, as Dr. Ahmed said, the non-realistic patient here, they need something, and their roof of expectation, we cannot reach it. And as far as that, we cannot reach their expectation. We cannot do anything. And in the worst case scenario, the non-dominant eye, when we will touch it, he will compare, he will close and see that I'm not seeing well with the distance here and I lost one or two line. And, and this is the problem. That's why I'm, I'm, I prefer just to push the patient. Okay, Osama, Osama, please. Yes, the same. Just I think it's the one message really that not what the patient wants. If we cannot achieve it, that's a good result. We shouldn't touch him. Really, it's not because the patient wants no glasses means I have to do something for him. Right. And really, yes. it should be very clear 
uh, we, Actually, we have a guy, this case this strict. case prepared for that for that reason osama yeah, we yeah, prepared I, I, this case. as i told you early i will refer to someone else Okay. Uh, actually, uh, our our consent should be modified. Actually, we didn't do that. It should be none. Uh, can I can I add a comment? Can I add yes. a comment, please, just yes. for ten seconds? I yes. have yes. received a message from uh, Dr. Sami Rabia from Kuwait. He is watching us nowadays, and he is suggesting to put an IPCL, with the a spheric or the presbyopic version of the fecic IL. So I would like to to hear the comments of the panelists. Why, here. doctor? If, this... uh, if doctor, if you can, if you at, can at join 50, us at age of fifty. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe at age of 50 or age of 45, for example, in the previous case, for example, that to uh, provide a temporary solution for the presbyopia management of this patient until the cataract develops, and then we can do the lens extraction but with the fake that, that, that lens will affect the distance vision, and, the, and the, we will return back to the same issues, that this yeah. case, this patient will be suffered from a drop of the distance vision at least one or two lines. And believe yeah. me, for those patients, what I'm doing is that I'm showing them by trifocal lens. The trifocal lens, Plano with, for example, added 2.5 or added three. Uh, okay. Put it on their, on their cornea and show them what they will see post-op. And they will be surprised and they will return back conv convinced totally that they will not do anything. Okay, yeah. can you hear Dr. Ahmed, uh, uh, if Dr. Uh, uh, Sani, my dear friends also, if he is uh, willing, if he can join us also, uh, I mean, live, uh, you can open the mic for him if you want and to, to, to discuss this point if you want. Dr. Sami, if you are hearing me, please, uh, yeah, just uh, there is an uh, option to raise the hand, then the company will open for you the mic so you can discuss with us. So let us go. To, now we can have the question again, uh, John. But uh, unfortunately, here, if you can add none, if there is possibility to add, uh, okay. It turned on for Sami Al Rabia for the mic. Yeah, if, yeah. If he is there, he can. Yes. Now we let us uh, see the result, and if Dr. Sami is there, please open for him. Okay. Can you see the result, please? But I think this one, if the question should be modified as of tonight, we didn't add this one. Um, so still, we are having the lens-based correction more. Whatsoever. Okay. And some of them they are having laser based. So do you want I, to summarize this? I, I have I have an idea. I have an idea. Nobody chose camera. So let's re-ask yeah. the question and choose camera that will mean that you will not touch this patient. Let's ask one more time like that. <laughs> uh, okay. For uh, Dr. Samuel, for you, can you repeat the question? And dear dear uh, colleagues, you are hearing us. If you think it's nothing to be done, just select the camera in there. Ca camera, uh, yes. Good, yeah, good yeah. idea. Uh, good suggestion. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Samuel, for this suggestion. Now we are having Dr. Sani uh, here with us. Dr. Sani, you can hear us, and you are now can, online. Can, can you start? Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can. can. Yes. Very nice that to hear you. Hear and I am very glad that you are with us, Yanni. I'm very happy that you are with us, Dr. Sani. أول شيء السلام عليكم وكل عام وانتم بخير. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم. It's an excellent idea if if the angle kappa is is minimal then the distance vision will never be affected يعني uh, it doesn't affect the distance vision but you have to have all other criteria AC depth more than 2.8 you have to have uh, white to white around the, say tw uh, 12, okay? So many other ideas. Sometimes you don't find this possible. But the angle kappa is very essential. Uh, also for the for the camera corneal inlay, I may say that I put around 70 camera inlay and it is beautiful if you place it on the visual axis. Believe me, if it is only 0.2 decentered, the patient hates you. So you have to make a excellent centration on the visual axis, not the corneal center. And this is the uh, uh, clue for the camera inlay. Go deep around 250 and put it. I stopped doing camera corneal inlay because really it takes long time putting it on the exact position. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dr. Sami, can Sani. you stay with us? Dr. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Mazen. 
يا دكتور سامي دو يو امبلانت ذس بارك الله فيك دكتور سامي دو يو دو يو امبلانت ذس فور ا 50 يير اولد بيشنت يو مين اي بي سي ال يس يس واي نوت 50 شوف 50 از لونج از هي از نوت كاتاركتس ستيل هيز يونج يعني يعني اي ام 70 يو ار 52 يو ار لا ام 50 ثانك يو فيري ماتش يو ار ستيل يونج اي ام 70 اي هاف ستيل كارير كورنيا And if I if I have a good AC depth, I don't mind to have an uh, IPCL presbyopic. Doctor Sami, Salamu alaikum, Doctor Sami. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Kif umurak al habib, kif sahtak. Is that when we are saying that that the ICL is not affecting the distance vision, especially for the for the presbyopia, what I'm doing is that I'm applying the trifocal uh, zero base and added uh, 2.5 to 3, and I found that this patient will change his mind directly. <laughs> So uh, ICL, that's right, maybe the, the contact lens, trifocal contact lens doesn't show the exact issues for the ICL, in spite of that, the difference is, is minimal, but still contact lens, tri trifocal contact lens, showing the refraction of the patient and the, the ad for it centrally, it can be a good test for those patients. If they accept it, then go ahead, you don't need to add You don't need to do a tri uh, uh, an added ICL. You need to do a trifocal lens IOL. For me, I will do IOL if they accept the contact lens trifocality. If they are not accepting it, means that I'm not, I'm not going are, to touch a, a clear lens. Yeah. About the distance vision, then I will not do it. Okay, can you have the last comment from Dr. Sami? Yes, Dr. Sami. Yes, I think camera inlay is a good one. Especially if you put a lens with a camera and lay, this is another option. Also, you have it. But keep in mind, if you are working on the plano, plane of the cornea, the, 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 the angle kappa is essential. I kept saying that. Very essential. You have to measure it. You have to go direct to the visual axis. But if you are going backward toward the cornea, toward the lens, and then this angle is not really important because the angle, this is the tip of the angle. They get closer to it. Okay. Okay, uh, شكرا دكتور okay, دكتور مازن you are mute can you please open your uh, Okay, uh, thank you everybody for the valuable comments. Uh, let's go for the five number five. Okay, so after this one, if you want to comment, Dr. Mazen, about the result. Uh, about the result, so uh, let's say most of us agree that uh, nothing to be done. Um, second, we may go for let's say, uh, laser-based, or uh, if the patient doesn't accept uh, losing some lines, then we can go for uh, either camera or uh, lens-based. Am okay, I correct? Do you, uh, about, yes. Uh, uh, about, do you have any comment about Dr. Sami uh, and suggestions? Also, Actually, I don't, I don't implant uh, the fake IOLs, regardless of the uh, brand name. But I don't is, implant is after the age of 45. But he about is talking camera? about a value, a value point that he is, this patient is a clear lens and he don't want to touch this one, this uh, uh, lens. So instead of doing lens based, he can do it. Yeah, an, an for the camera. And, yeah, this is what uh, uh, the priority is nothing to do or lens based, uh, sorry, laser based okay. or camera, let's say, or uh, lens based. So the lens based is the last option. Okay. But, but uh, personally, personally, I don't do lens based in such cases. Of course not. I don't do anything for this patient. Okay, thank you very much for all. Let's go and let us be more shorter in the time because still we are having about uh, at least 15 questions there waiting for us. Uh, this is the fifth, uh, we have still another three cases. So please, as fast as we can. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Uh, Mazen. Okay. So 55 year old, myopic astigmatism. Coronal higher order abrasions, good. 7.5 RMS, comma, wow. Amount, it should okay. be like uh, It should be like a keratoconus then. Uh, so, comma uh, among them, about 0.5. Ah, comma yes. among them is 0.5, okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, cataract. G3, okay. Mm -hmm. What to do? What to do? There is no question here for the uh, participant for the sake of time, can we go for discussion, Dr. Mazin? Go ahead. Uh, um, let's say that the 7.5 RMS with the comma just 0.5, it means that the patient uh, maybe had a previous 
uh, corneal surgery, for example, uh, myopic or hyperopic treatment. This is why the comma is 0 0.5 and the remaining is uh, on account of, the, uh, of uh, for example, spherical aberration, a trefoil. Yeah, cousin, maybe. If, if he has any previous surgery, the spherical abrasion will be clear. High. Here, here is the coma is high. It's not the spherical abrasion. No, no, yes? the coma is 0 0.5. Yes, my dear. The, 0 0.5 the and the total RMS and the total RMS is 7.5. Which means that the rest is trifo trifoil and the spherical abrasion. So it's yeah, hard. Yeah, this is what I be, said. Yeah, it's hardly to be post-surgical, especially for myopic treatment. It's hardly to be. Yeah, Usually, so, uh, post-surgical post yeah. myopic, the spherical abrasion will be higher. Will be will taking the whole uh, root mean square total. Okay, this is what I'm saying, Doctor uh, Safwan. Look at yeah. the comma is 0 0.5. The total is 7.5. So yeah. seven is not related to the comma. Anyway, okay. Okay, go ahead, Doctor Safwan. Uh, okay, now the, the cataract. There is a cataract. So what do you think? It's 55 year old. So I think. Uh, um, Lens-based is an option, but we have to know to figure out why there is an RMS, very high RMS because of the cornea. So let yeah. me start with uh, Ahmed Assaf. Uh, I have a high suspicion that this patient might have uh, some, some sort of form for cornea. So I would do corneal topography first to start to analyze what's wrong with his cornea yeah. to get a very high coma and RMS. And if they prove that there is some inferior steepening or some sort of... Uh, cornea, uh, the keratoconus, so I would implant a lens, uh, a monofocal, just a monofocal lens. Uh, okay, uh, Sami, Dr. Sami, please. Uh, 7.5, still high. Okay, so one, one of two, either you go for something, something like customized PRK or PTK, something to reduce this uh, RMS as much as you can, and then if you give him a, uh, the, the, the surgery and you put the lens, it's going to be better. So this is one. Or you go for the small pupil technique, which is either to make a very small pupil, and that's what you will reduce this RMS after, after I mean, at IOL. You make very small pupil, so you will reduce this RMS tremendously. Or you put a camera and lay inside the lens. So IOL with a camera and lay. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I would agree with what Dr. Ahmad Assaf uh, said by analyzing the cornea first. And if I would go to the lens space, I will choose a monofocal lens with monovision, with giving him uh, minus one uh, or 1 1.5 in one eye and the plano in the other eye. Of course, the non-dominant eye I will target minus 1.25, and in the other eye, uh, plane. Okay. Uh, okay, Safwan, please. So uh, the, 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 the assessment, as, the, as the, all our colleagues say, that, that we need a corneal map assessment, and uh, uh, most of those patients having a corneal uh, opacity in the center, that creates such a high comma and... Uh, and, and uh, as, as a result, a high total, uh, 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 high total high order abrasions with myopic astigmatism. So I agree uh, if, if the patient agreed with, with a monof monofocal as a baseline, ba lens base, I will go to, uh, as Dr. Uh, uh, Sami said, I will go to, a custo uh, to, to do a laser customized uh, ablation to uh, get rid of this uh, opacities, if there is, and this high order abrasions. And then I will go with the monovision, uh, a monofocal lens monovision uh, for this patient if he uh, decide to go through um, uh, a correction of a distance. And otherwise, I will I will put only monovision for a distance, and that's all. With the glasses for near. Yeah, Rohit. Uh, I I personally uh, feel that uh, in this patient with the RMS of seven point five and the coma of point five. Uh, I my bet is it's a post-operative uh, case, and, uh -huh. uh, and because it has to be a very very advanced flat cornea, must the patient uh -huh. must have been a myope, 
the exactly. cornea is flat. I, I understand the coma is on the higher side, but RMS of 7.5 is very high. That's first yeah. thing. Yeah. And the second most important thing is, in this patient with such high RMS, I would, before we do anything, uh, the most important test is the epithelial mapping. Okay. The reason is, with such, it, I, I assume that it's a very flat cornea. The keratometry readings must be in 32, 32, 33, because only if you have such flat corneas, will have such high RMS without coma. And uh, if it's a flatter cornea, then the whole management would differ because even if you had to do a customized ablation we to regularize it, epithelium here would be a very, very important level. This is my take on this case. Uh, would you please repeat the last point about the epithelial mapping? It is very, very important. The reason is that the cornea... In this case, the RMS is so high, but the coma is, it's not a decentered cornea. It's not a keratoconic eye. Exactly. Because keratoconus would have had a huge amount of coma there. It mm -hmm. would be in, the, say, a one, uh, more than one, but here is around 0.5. I yes. feel it's a small decentration with the very flat eye. And uh, yes. the, because it's flat, the epithelium must be regularized, trying to regularize it with a huge amount of change. So epithelial map is probably very, very important in this particular patient before we plan anything, including an IOS surgery. Uh, yeah, what, what did you assume, one, one, one point, Dr. Mazin, this case is taken from a real case. I had it and the patient having uh, um, uh, corneal uh, uh, opacity, I, I, I need to just to comment on uh, Rahit, this patient uh, having a trachomatous corneal opacity and he has this sign, but uh, there's no any post-operative uh, uh, issues, there is no any operation, and for those that they have operation, uh, 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 you need to uh, ask about spherical abrasion. His spherical abrasion is point two five, uh, uh, less than 1.2, uh, sorry, 0.12, uh, so uh, it's nothing. So it's very hardly to see any post-operative with, with spherical abrasion of, one, of 0.12. Uh, anyway, uh, 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 it might be because, but this is the case. This is the issue. It's a real okay, case. Safu Doctor, yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Safwan, now uh, the scar, of course, will cause the uh, very high RMS. So you said coma is 0 0.5. Uh, the spherical aberration is 0 0.12. So uh, the remaining is trefoil. Yeah, trefoil, yeah, trefoil is, is coming. The, the trefoil is the problem is because, yeah. because the, the opacity creates this trefoil. That's all. Okay. Now, uh, regarding the, the answer, uh, I think we, all of us, should have asked about the visual acuity of the patient. Yeah. What is the visual acuity, the corrected visual acuity of the yeah, patient? That's, that's the question that you need to ask. Because yeah, what, here <laughs> is the issues that they're very simple. Why I, I answered in the, 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 and, and, and the Sami answered the same issues is that this kind of, this patient, the best corrected visual acuity is 0.3 or 0.4. That's what I, I remember. And if you will see the depth of the corneal opacity is, is only superficial uh, depth. It's around, uh, 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 let us say, 20 micron, 25 micron. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, when, when I corrected with the, with the laser base, it's, it, was, it was beautifully corrected in a way that the patient disappeared. He didn't do the cataract for one and a half year. And okay, then you did PTK? Did you do PTK or PRK? No. No, no, it's a, a trans PRK customized with a corneal wave front guided. Including the refractive treatment, yeah, the myopic exactly. astigmatism. Yes, exactly. Okay. Good. Because the cataract was uh, around the grade, yeah, I mean, that grade three in spite of that, but the patient disappeared from my side around one year, one and a half year. Then he returned back when the vision started to be deteriorated from the cataract. Mm -hmm. So it means that the, the treatment of the cornea was so efficient in a way that he ran away from that. Okay, Dr. Mazen, if you can please shorten the, this one because it's, we are running behind the time. Okay, uh, great. Uh, okay. Of course, we have to, to know, uh, whenever we see such a case, we have to know the source of this high RMS. So we have to uh, check the transparency of the cornea. Yes. And uh, we have to check the topography. We have to know the best corrected visual acuity. And based on that, we can plan. So let's move to the next one. Please. Okay, so next one. Uh, uh, okay. 
let us go for K6. And uh, this one, if you allow me, Dr. Nazan, if we can go very mm -hmm. far, we'll ask only three uh, of the speakers, those they didn't uh, participate, Dr. Uh, Osama and Dr. Arthur in this case. And one Dr. More. Arthur left, Dr. Samuel left. Ah, Dr. Samuel, okay. So because we are running behind the time. So patient is under one presbyopia correction by implanted camera array. So patient came unhappy. So what to do? Okay, what about the visual acuity? What about? Uh, he's not happy in the visual acuity. Let's say it's uh, for the above. Is the camera uh, decentered? Yeah, this is the, the aim of this one is to know that if the, this one is camera LA because it's most of the time is not con uh, in center, that's why we are looking to remove this. Okay, uh, we have to know uh, why the patient is unhappy. Uh, is it because he developed the cataract? patient? He don't know. For example, if we are, if yeah, we yeah, want I to know. Say, oh. I know. After we check the patient, we have to know yeah. the source of this unhappiness. Is it because oh. he developed cataract? And no, the no, camera he's not is... cataract. He's not in a cataract. No, it's no, no cataract. Because... No cataract. No. No, no refractive error. No refractive error. Okay, so the the camera. Is either... only uh, it was corrected for uh, uh, a near vision as a presbyopic, and he don't have any other uh, uh, any other problem in his eye. Uh, so most probably the camera is uh, decentered. Okay, because we want, in this case, we want to highlight this the most, as Dr. Sami and Dr. Sopoan mentioned, the most important things is centration of the camera LA to have a good yeah, result. Otherwise, kappa. this, yeah, yeah, then we will have other problems. This is the aim of this uh, case. Yeah. If there is any no, comment from Dr. Ahmed, just ask Dr. Sami for this question. Let him answer it because he uh, implants 70. Uh, a camera, so he Dr. might. Sammy is with us. Yes, still yes. With us, Dr. Yes. yes, yes, I am. Uh, Dr. Sami, please, okay. if you don't mind, that okay. we have a patient with camera in lay, yes. and yes, this yes, patient, yes. he started I, I... unhappy, and okay. when we are uh, 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 assess everything in this patient, we found that this inlay is decentered. De so what's your management? واحد. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. He started to be unhappy, يعني هو كان happy الأول. If he was no. happy, yeah, no, no, he was happy, happy ever, ever, ever after and, immediately, yeah. Unhappy, then decentered. There are a few two points you have to go for it. You have to go very, very deep, 250 or deeper. That's the first thing. The second thing, you have to, to be centered. Now, it is really very, very difficult to centralize it. I made a technique, I published that technique, and now you, you will go for PTK, Will BTK خليه على center على the visual axis. BTK uh, 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 3.8 by the depth of only uh, 10 or 15 microns. This BTK will make a mark on the cornea, and this mark is the only thing that you can go inside and push your inlay to to go exactly at the mark. Once you put your inlay inside the mark, the patient will be very happy. I had maybe four or no more, maybe 10 patients I had to uh, reshift it. And if you look at them before on the topography, they look excellent. But once I push them, they become better. And if they are slightly decentered, nasally or inferiorly around 0.1 milli, there is no harm. But never ever make it decentered nasally or superiorly. Okay? So recenter the, 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 the camera. It is dead easy. I'll tell you the technique if you, you, if you need. After you open it, you put some uh, 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 distilled water. So this will distill. You, you will make the section easier. And then there is a rabia spatula, which is just a spatula to use to, to, uh, to move the camera and lay. You put it inside, and then it hangs it on top of it. You push it either forward, uh, I mean, in, uh, centrally, backward, or upward, according to the mark which you made it on the corneal surface, not on anything else. Don't rely on the patient red reflex. Pay on the mark you made it by your PTK. That's it. Okay, I think, thank you, Dr. Sami, for clarification. Okay, let's go to the last uh, uh, case. So we want to finish as soon as possible. Patient underwent a brisk by the correction by laser-based correction. Age is 47. 
and his patient came now with age of 59 having cataract G3. Okay, uh, what to do? And he want to get uh, rid of uh, respiratory glass. Okay, so we have laser based previously, but uh, we want to know what was the laser based, which type of laser based? Was it mini monovision uh, or was it the uh, aesthetic of the cornea? So, so far? So I think that, that he, he is he's in, in, in an extended depth of uh, focus mm -hmm. and uh, micro monovision. Mm -hmm. So, micro monovision, that's in a predominant eye. Uh, it's uh, minus 0.25, and, and, and non-dominant eye is min minus 0.75, and he has a micro addition, micro mono addition means that it's, a, it's an indominant eye around uh, plus 1.5, and in a non-dominant eye, it was uh, 2, plus 2, as an addition. Okay, now, so the, it ten is years, like... Around 10 years, uh, more than 10 years, he came back with a cataract grade three. So what's the concept of our treatment in those? Because uh, now I have around, let us say uh, 20, 25 patients. Uh, they are uh, coming together with a deterioration of vision. Most of them, they have cataract. What is the uh, uh, spherical abrasion of the cornea? The spherical abrasion of the cornea that we start with, the, usually our laser machine, it's maintained the sphericity within the normal sphericity, which is uh, from plus minus 0.25. Now, in this case, we have a minus, a, a, a minus spherical abrasion centrally, which is the add. And okay. positive spherical abrasion around, um, let us say, for example, 0.3 or 0.3.5, something like that, that I remember, because it's, these figures is very difficult to remember it. So it is multifocal cornea, let's say. Yeah, it is multifocal cornea created by a negative spherical abrasion. Okay. So um, that, um, that, that I think, yeah, yeah. This can we hurry uh, in this? Yeah, yeah Ahmed yeah. Asaf, let's uh, hear his. Sorry, uh, Ahmed, please. Okay, uh, this is a very tricky patient because uh, I would like to have uh, an idea about the cornea of this patient. So I would put in front of the topography or the pentacam to see what kind of uh, laser abrasion he had before. If it's a hypropic ablation or the myopic ablation, because you know that hypropic ablation, it's tricky for the decent, for the centration. So this, if the patient had previous hypropic ablation before uh, putting a trifocal or uh, sometimes even the extended depth of focus put the patient on high risk of dissatisfaction because of the induced coma or the disintegration of the cornea or the laser profile in the past. Myopic, probably the myopic ablation, it's more or less forgiving. So I, I would like to have an idea about the optical zone of the ablation and what about the, the coma of this patient, the corneal coma and spherical ablation before starting to make the decision. Most probably these patients are very eligible for extended depth of focus and sometimes even for the trifocal lenses with a new version of the trifocal lens, as long as the, uh, for example, the myopic ablation is, does not uh, deteriorate the shape of the cornea and the optical zone is beyond the six millimeter optic zone and the cornea profile or the shape of profile is aspheric because we have now aspheric ablation profile is not like the oblate cornea the aspherical ablation profile when producing oblate cornea in the past so it's we should have more data on this patient before making a decision to implant a premium lens or just a monofocal lens to treat his cataract mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. If there is any other opinion rather than Dr. Ahmed, what he mentioned. If any, Dr. Usama or Dr. Imad? Or Rohit. Rohit, I think he left. Dr. Rohit, yeah, he left. Rohit, he left, I think. Okay, Dr. Imad, Dr. Usama. Dr. Muhammad, uh, in this case, as there is a multifocal ablation already there on the cornea, uh, I do agree that we need to uh, carefully study this cornea, particularly the spherical abrasion. For me, if this is spherical abrasion was within the normal, uh, what we call the therapeutic uh, range, which is between um, or less than minus six, 0 0.6. Uh, and that patient's uh, ablation profile is well-centered. And he was happy previously with his vision 
uh, with uh, his normal lens, which is uh, usually simulating a monofocal lens, I would go to a uh, monofocal lens in this case. And uh, in case uh, there is a decision to go for uh, extended depth of focus, I would uh, warn the patient that there might be some uh, area of adaptation in the beginning, because in these cases, we would have uh, two, two levels of multifocality in these eyes. So okay, thank my, you. Preferred, my, 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 my preferred choice will be to go to uh, mono, mono vision, uh, monofocal lens. So, Usama, you have any other uh, suggestions? Not to comment, no, it's the same. I think it's, uh, it's the, depends on the corneal, uh, how much the corneal regularity, uh, is he had mono vision before accepted or not. Uh, maybe a dove, maybe a, if it's not very high uh, regularity in the cornea as an option. Okay, uh, Dr. Mazin, if you have any uh, closing for this uh, case, then we have to finalize because we are already uh, more than one hour more behind the times. Okay, now, um, actually, if the corneal abrasions are high, then um, we have to avoid the diffractive. This is what I learned today from the colleagues. We have to avoid the diffractive uh, types of premium lenses. Otherwise, we can't go for that. Any comment from Dr. Safwan? Because he yes, looks that like he's dealing with these cases. Yes. Can, yeah. uh, not all yeah. cases, only, uh, okay. Can you hear on the last case, Dr. Safwan? On the, the yes, last my case dear. comment? Yeah. The, the, you are hearing me now well? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so the issues is that when, when we didn't have first the non-diffractive EDOF, uh, we, uh, our option was the monovision spheric, not aspheric. Because yes. aspheric monovision, it, cu it cut part of the uh, negative spherical abrasion that we create uh, potentially. Yes. So we were doing it. And by the way, the biometry would not affected by the negative spherical abrasion that it's created by the uh, machine. So we are easily doing the uh, biometry for those patients. Now, when EDOF, a non-diffractive EDOF started, then here, here we have a new option as... Uh, Dr. Imad Alilo said that we have a new option if the cornea shows centrally a uh, centrally located uh, negative spherical abrasion and the total spherical abrasion, a positive spherical abrasion was uh, within the range normal plus plus minus 0.4 that my my range, then I can go through and I can do the non diffractive uh, uh, edof in those patients. Otherwise, monovision spheric for those patients that can maintain the near vision as it's, uh, it's planned before, yes, they can. And they might have, they might lose one line of near vision, but not distance. And this one line of near vision, it was in, in my mind that, that I was doing it, uh, or in my practice, I was doing it in adjusting the uh, monovision, not micro monovision. The monovision means that it was minus 0.5, minus 0.75 in non-dominant eye. I will make it minus one or minus 1.25. And the minus 0.25, it will be around adjusted according to the demand of the patient for the distance or near. Okay, that was my, 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 uh, my, uh, my plan. But when Edof started, it's a new era. Now we can are. You, can you fast and Dr. Safwan, can you give the very fast comment about the last point? Yeah. That's it off. Now it started because now we are running the uh, uh, a study with there and we are seeing which one so, of them. So it of either the solution line, it can be a solution. Promising. It's a promising yes. okay. technology. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Safwan. We are having, I have so many questions. I select this one uh, from Dr. Nancy Abrakaj. Can you please differentiate between it of light? Uh, symphony or monofocal edof like uh, the isobure or the do you see this from the SAP IOL in borderline cases? Do you have anyone have an idea about different type well, of see, the, the issues is that here it's uh, as I said it's a new technology and and there is a lot of variation between the the companies that they are producing these lens. I don't know whether uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ahmed Asaf he has some comment of on different between Symphony, Ahmed, uh, Symphony, and the Bosch and Lom. Monofocal uh, and you see this. 
sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, from, yes. from physical and monofocal. The question is there, can you please go ahead, Dr. Ahmed? Yes, uh, um, I planted the, uh, some eyes with the symphony lens and I'm not uh, very happy with these lenses, even with the virgin eyes. So I stopped implanting symphony lens. So as long as it's a diffractive monofocal or extended depth of focus lens, it's not succeeding my hands. I'm not sure about your opinion, but uh, I think I'm very excited about the new extended depth of focus because it's based on the refractive optics, not the diaphragm optics, uh, like the eye hands and isopure lenses of fine vision or the JMJ. So most probably this lens will have a market share, bigger market share in the near future, but uh, still we are not registered in my area. I don't have uh, too much experience with these lenses, uh, clinical experience or just theoretical experience. So I, uh, the, I believe that the optics now is shifting toward the refractive optics for the extended depth of focus yes. lenses rather than the diaphragm optics. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you, Dr. Safan. Please, we are already behind the time. I will ask please, uh, Dr. Safan and Dr. Mazel if you can go through the questions and answer personally, just because we have a lot and we cannot, we are apologize from the uh, participant for the, to answer this question because they, we are running behind the time. So I think just, that Mazen, he left? No, he's there. Dr. Mazen is here. Mazen is there. Yeah, so Dr. Mazen and Mazen, Dr. Yeah. Safwan, yeah. Mazen, because if you are me, you can go to the question and answer, give your answer directly to them, answer them. So let Mazen start it. Let Mazen start, please. Uh, no, actually, I have one, to I'm not uh, asking a question to answer here. You will answer by typing. We are going to close now. Yeah. Oh, okay, done. So done. they will receive only their answer by uh, uh, there, not by, by listening to the question as this. We are having only one raise okay. hand. Uh, still, Dr. Raed is the last question. Dr. Raed is there. Uh, yeah, if he is there, otherwise we'll close. I would like, first of all, to thank you very much. This topic, I don't, well, I don't think that it will take that time, but we take longer, more than one and a half hour, more than anticipating time. Uh, thank you for all. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for sharing your experience with us. It was a pleasure to be with us. Dr. Rahid, Dr. Uh, also Arthur, and our colleagues also, Dr. Mazen, Dr. Iman, Dr. Osama, and Dr. Tokwan. And a special thanks also to uh, Novartis, for uh, uh, sponsoring this meeting. And we are having this Dr. Raid. Yes, Dr. Raid, can you go ahead and ask your question? Dr. Raid, we are listening to you. If you are there, please. Dr. Raid. So I think by this, we will close. Uh, thank you very much. We hope to see you, inshallah, soon. So please, before we close, um, uh, we just go and answer Dr. Mazel and Dr. Ahmed, uh, Dr. Sorry, so far, if you allow me, go to the question and write the, your comment. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And good night. See you, inshallah, in the future. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, everyone. So far, Mazel, don't go, please. Where are you, Mazel? How you will answer the question?